All right, take it away, Mr. Chairman. Chair notes the time is six o'clock. I call this meeting of the Amherst Zoning Board of Appeals to order. My name is Steve Judge, as ZBA Chair, I want to welcome everyone to this meeting. We'll begin with a roll call of ZBA members and panel for this matter. Uh, Steve Judge is present. Mr. Craig Meadows? Present. Mr. Gilbert? I know he's absent. Mr. Henry? Here. And Mr. Sloviter? Here. The quorum is present. Also attending the public hearing tonight is Ms. Christine Brestrup, Planning Director, Mr. Rob Wachilla, Planner for the Town, Rob Mora, Building Commissioner, and Guilford Mooring, Director of Public Works. Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 21, extended by Chapter 2 of the Acts of 2023, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to observe the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. No in-person attendance will, of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. The Zoning Board of Appeals is a quasi-judicial body that operates under the authority of Chapter 40A of the General Laws of the Commonwealth for the purpose of promoting the health, safety, convenience, and general welfare of the inhabitants of the town of Amherst. In accordance with the provisions of Massachusetts General Laws, Chapter 40A and Article 10, Special Permit Granting Authority of the Amherst Zoning Bylaw, this public meeting has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and mailed to parties of interest. All hearings and meetings are open to the public and are recorded by town staff and may be viewed via the Town of Amherst YouTube channel and the ZBA webpage. The procedure is as follows. The petitioner presents the application to the board during the hearing, after which the board will ask questions for clarification or additional information. After the board has completed its questions, the board will seek public input. The public speaks with the permission of the chair. If a member of the public wishes to speak, they should so indicate by using the raised hand function on their screen or by pressing star nine on their phone. The chair with the assistance of the staff will call upon people wishing to speak. When you are recognized, provide your name and address to the board for the record. All questions and comments must be addressed to the board. The board will normally hold public hearings where information about the project and input from the public is gathered, followed by public meetings for each. The public meeting portion is where the board deliberates and is generally not an opportunity for public comment. If the board feels it has enough information and time, it will decide upon the applications tonight. Each petition heard by the board is distinct and evaluated on its own, own merits, and the board is not ruled by precedent. Statutorily, for a special permit, the board has 90 days from the close of hearing to file a decision. For a variance, the board has 100 days from the date of filing to file its decision. No decision is final until the written decision is signed by the sitting board members and is filed in the town clerk's office. Once the decision is filed with the town clerk, there's a 20 day appeal period for an aggrieved party to contest the decision with the relevant judicial body and superior court. After the appeal period, the permit must be recorded as a registry of deeds to take effect. Tonight's agenda, uh, approval of minutes from the August 24th, 2023 meeting, a public hearing on ZBA FY 2023-18, ASD Shootsbury MA Solar LLC, request for a special permit under section 3.340 of the zoning bylaw to construct a 9.35 um, MWDC 4.4 MWAC ground mounted solar, solar voltaic array spanning 41 acres on a 102 acre site with an accompanying battery energy storage system at three parcels of land owned by WD Coles Inc. identified as map 9B parcels 11, 12 and map 9D parcel 27. On Shootsbury Road, RO Outline Residence Zoning District. Frontage and access to the subject parcels of land is located between 187 and 201 Shootsbury Road. This is continued from August 24th, our meeting on August 24th. ZBA FY 2024-04, Charles Dana and Roki Zong request for a special permit under section 3.3211 of the zoning bylaw to convert an existing owner-occupied duplex structure into a non-owner-occupied duplex with two rental units, five bedrooms in total, at 62 Taylor Street, 
Map 14B, Parcel 74, RG, General Residence Zoning District. Following that is a general public comment period on matters not before the board tonight, and other and then undertake other business not anticipated within the last 48 hours. Um, are there any public disclosures? I have one. I've submitted the required Mullins form, or Mullins form, uh, certifying or attesting that I have viewed the video of uh, the the August 24th meeting, and so I have. Uh, completed the requirements to be able to continue to participate in this matter. So no other disclosures. The first order of business is the approval of our minutes from August 24th. I reviewed the minutes uh, and, that, and they seem in, in, uh, complete, but I wasn't at the meeting. They do, com they do comport with what I saw in the recording. However, I wonder if anybody else has any changes to the minutes, the minutes from August 24th. These are great minutes, um, Rob, thanks very much. They're done quickly and well, and uh, I appreciate it. It's important. Um, so I would entertain a motion to approve the minutes. So moved. Is there a second? Second. second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the minutes. Any discussion? If not, we'll take a vote. The chair votes aye. Mr. Meadows? Aye. Mr. Henry? Aye. Mr. Sloviter? Aye. And Mr. Um, Mr. Gilbert is not here. So the motion passes 4-0 with one abstention. Most of the amendments are approved. So the first order of business tonight is, on uh, the first um, application tonight is ZBA FY 2023. That's the Shrewsbury Road um, Solar Array. And the first thing I want to do is I want to thank Mr. Meadows and compliment him for the way he handled this last meeting. You did a great job and you better be careful because if you keep doing that, we might ask you to do it more often. So <laughs> hey, thanks again for doing that in August. It allowed me to take a trip. It was great. Um, so what I propose tonight is we do the following. Uh, the first order of business is Shootsbury Road. I'd like to have that on for the for no more than two hours. I don't think it should take that long, but uh, if it does, I want to end it at two hours, so end at eight o'clock, so we can move on to the other application. If that's done and we still have time, we can go back to Shootsbury Road, but I think we'll probably be done. So, but I'd like to get that done and out of the way first, and then make sure we have time for the uh, Taylor Street um, application. So we'll now continue the hearing on ZBA FY 2023-18 ASD Shootsbury Solar LLC. Um, there was a site visit there on October 3rd. Um, we met with the representative of the applicant. We walked through the site, um, through much of the site along the access road, did a little bit of bushwhacking, but not too much. We got to see the, the, uh, the layout of the, the area where the solar arrays are going to be. We um, saw the areas where the, um, you have to have a space for, and buffer for ground, for water and for the concert, for the CONCOM considerations. We um, also looked at the type of vegetation that has been there. We asked questions about the history of the property and the ownership and what kind of trees would be replaced or would be taken down, the method of taking them down and would they be stumped or would they just be cut off in addition, there were several um, other, those are sort of general questions about the property, but there were questions which, Rob, you created a document that you know, was submitted that had several questions that I think were important for tonight, and I want to restate those. One, where is the nearest wells located, and how close will the construction be to them? The nearest wells meaning the, the well, wells that people use for their well water. So where are the nearest wells to the, to the project? How far away will the closest tree canopy be, be to, a, to a solar array? What happens to the trees when they're cut down? How far from the, will the project be from Adams Brook, which runs, I think, outside the property, but very close to the, the property and is downhill? And how close will the solar array be to the steep slopes that leads towards Adams Brook? Were there any other questions or any other comments that people want to add in terms of the disclosure for what we did on our um, site visit? Mr. Henry? I, I think you covered them, Mr. Chair. 
Great. All right. So those are the that was there. Um, we do have to go through submissions. I'm using the, um, project, the draft project application report of October 6th as my guide for submissions. Um, I've got, hold on. So since the August meeting, we've had a management plan submitted. These are applicants submissions, management plan submitted October 2nd, a new battery energy storage system submitted October of uh, this year, evidence of insurance updated in this October, application change log, a transmittal to the fire department and a transmittal to the ZBA. In terms of storage and wetland reports, we've had a Goddard ANRAD booklet dated October 5th, and we've also had a record conditions plan was updated on September 27th. In terms of emergency procedures and maintenance, energy storage plan updated September 23rd, a POW down emergency response guide, a POW in, excuse me, POW in emergency response guide, and a POW in fire off gas emergency procedures. Um, in terms of deconditioning documents, we received an updated draft decommissioning document, but not the final version. Um, we talked about the site visit. There were a couple other documents received. We had a, a document from Jason Skeels that came in. And I think there was, was there something from the, was there additional documentation or a letter from the fire department that came in since, or is that not, am I, incorrect on all that so there was the um town engineer okay. yep. town engineer jason Steele. but there was also a um public comment submitted too from um ira brick and yes. that was set in today as well um there's also another public comment but i believe i included it in the packet it was from uh jenny kalik and one other person yeah. they they yeah. um sign a letter together but th that's that's pretty much it mr chairman you you hit everything um that yeah. has been submitted since okay so since this is a continuation of the last meeting, um, this what we what we want to talk about today is one, give the applicant a chance to review some of the change in documents if it's important, or if board members have questions about um, some of the, if they perhaps asked for some of these updated documents, they may have questions about them. I'd like to deal with that first. Um, if there are any questions about the updates, we also understand that there's a we received a, a document that talks about the work in progress. And so we know there's more documents that are coming. Um, and we, if, if the applicant wants to speak about the process on that, that's fine. That'd be helpful too. But, so talk about the documents and the questions, follow up on the questions you had at the last meeting. And then I'd like to get into the peer review process and what we want to talk about, uh, what kind of additional help we as board members feel we need um, and have that discussion. So that's where I'd like, how I'd like to handle the, the, the hearing this evening. Are there any other questions about that or comments or suggestions for change? All right, we'll do that. We'll do those things and then we'll have public comment after we dispose of the, of the um, peer review questions. So who's, who's representing the applicant? So there is a team that includes Tom Reedy. So I'm going to promote him first and then promote a few other people. All right. See who we got. Tom, is there anybody else from your team uh, besides Steve, Corey, Andrew that you want promoted? Or I think that's it. I think okay. that's that's good. Thank you. Yep. So, Mr. Reedy, why don't we have everybody introduce themselves and give their name and get that out of the out of the way so we're not interrupting them later on. <laughs> Perfect. As um, efficient as we could be. Yep. Sure. So I'm Tom Reedy, attorney with Bacon Wilson out of Amherst here on behalf of the applicant. I'll turn it over to Andrew. Hi, my name is Andrew Chabot. I'm uh, director of de development here at Pure Sky, uh, representing the applicant and uh, joined by Corey McCandless, um, also representing Pure Sky. And you're, you both live in Mr. Shadow. You live where? 
I live in Watertown, Massachusetts. And Corey, I don't know your last name. Uh, yeah, I've recently relocated to uh, Colorado. To Colorado, okay. But from Maine, so not too, too far. And and your last name? Uh, McCandless. McCandless, all right, Ms. McCandless. Mr. Reedy, go ahead. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And so I think you had a, a great preface of what we hope to accomplish tonight at the hearing. Uh, this is a process, right? We're taking all comments that we're getting from um, town departments, town staff, uh, public seriously investigating uh, and figuring out how that fits into the overall plan. So, um, you know, one of the, the big pieces there is going to be the peer review. And so that's why we're happy this evening uh, that you're going to hopefully um, vote to, to have a peer review, and obviously that's at the applicant's expense. Um, in addition to that site walk that you talked about the next night, we were in front of the planning board, October 4th. Uh, we got some good feedback from them as well, um, and that helped to inform some of the design and, and um, some of the other comments that we got. We submitted that Friday, October 5th, uh, an ANRAD, an abbreviated notice of resource area delineation, which is meant to delineate the resource areas, right? Just like it sounds like. Uh, there was one, as you know, it had expired on its own terms. And also one of the conditions of that required us to go back out in the field. And so that's what we're doing. Uh, we've had our wetland scientist reflag um, and it's essentially been the same. There might've been maybe three flags that have moved, but they don't impact uh, the project at all. We're still able to keep the project a hundred feet away from those resource areas. Um, it's currently with the conservation commission. They've got a site walk scheduled. It's in process. We expect the resource area delineation to be reviewed itself. So really just scientifically, what is a resource area, what is not, and then that will help set the boundaries. Obviously, if there's any material change to what those boundaries are, then we've got a decision to make, either you know, pursue a notice of intent through the Conservation Commission or modify the project to remain outside of it. So you know, that's in process, but given what we've seen so far from our wetland scientists and that this has been peer reviewed before, you know, we feel pretty comfortable with where those lines are. So that that's in process. I don't know the hearing date yet for the Conservation Commission. Um, I would expect it's upcoming in the next few weeks. Um, and once we get that order of resource area delineation, then that will help to set the boundaries of exactly where those resource areas are. Uh, in addition, and I'm going to turn it over to Andrew in a moment, you know, uh, Pierce Guy has been working on all of the comments that we've been getting from FIRE, uh, from um, conservation from Erin. I think she had the most voluminous comments specifically about stormwater. And so, you know, I think with this uh, stormwater peer review that will help um, to hopefully make the, the town feel comfortable that this has been designed uh, accurately. So with that, maybe Andrew, I'll turn it over to you to talk through some of the other submissions, changes, et cetera. Uh, and then, you know, ultimately, Mr. Chair, we expect to get this hearing continued whether that's to, you know, beginning of December, you know, I don't know, depending upon the time frame for getting that peer review engineer and then uh, getting in the material, getting the feedback. You know, we've always found it works best when it's collaborative because that always gets the best project where the peer reviewer says, hey, here are the issues. The engineer says, let's talk about how to resolve them. So I don't know if that's sometime early December uh, mid-December, but that's, I think, the time frame we're thinking about. So just to put that uh, out into the universe, but I'll be quiet and turn it over to Andrew. Great. Thanks very much, Tom. And uh, thank you all for having us here tonight and giving us the time to talk about this project. Um, yeah, I'm happy to explain what we've been working on since we last met. Um, on the 6th, we did submit the documents you have uh, before you. Um, those documents were uh, partly those that were requested to have um, formerly AMP Energy up, upload, uh, updated to reflect Pure Sky Energy. There's also a few more documents here, such as the, the new uh, wetland delineation survey, as Tom mentioned, that was carried out in the interim. Um, and then the record conditions plans were updated to just show those results, which, as, as Tom mentioned, really didn't result in any substantial, uh, substantive change there. Uh, we've also updated a, a couple details on the uh, energy storage safety mitigation plan, uh, two of which have come from the manufacturer, 
and uh, a few that were uh, revised on our side. Uh, one thing to note I want to be very clear about is that the uh, batteries have now been uh, reduced in size by about half. So um, that is one change we've made, and that's primarily to save on capital expenditure cost, um, to still stay in compliance with what we're required to do with the SMART program in the state, but to do something that's going to be a little bit less upfront cost for the project to, to bear. Um, so that has been a change. Uh, that is re uh, recorded in the uh, the best narrative uh, to indicate it's a two hour battery now instead of a four and a half hour battery. Um, so that's a that is a big change. Um, what is what was a main focus for us was to try to do as much progress as we could on the transmittals. Um, one of which was from from this board, um, and we were able to uh, get through those those questions to provide answers and submit those uh, along with the fire department. But as Tom also mentioned, the, the one from the uh, Conservation Commission is uh, taking a little bit more time. And we are actively uh, had some conference with a representative from the CONCOM to try to uh, you know, chat about some of the things we can modify and uh, what, what we can do to, to uh, make those changes. Uh, those are nearing completion, but aren't complete yet. And then uh, in line with uh, a hopeful peer review process, we thought it might be more effective for the board's review to, uh, in conjunction with a peer reviewer, to work on all these potential changes at the same time before resubmitting anything so there's fewer versions to, to review, just for ease of management. Uh, and that really includes the, the site plan, any uh, stormwater changes if necessary, the operations and maintenance plan, phasing plan, and project narrative. All those are effectively really kind of referencing one another. So any changes that might be required of the site plan will certainly reference everything else. So wanted to make sure we uh, we didn't send more than one version over if, uh, if anything did need to be modified. So I can pause there. I'm happy to explain in detail any of these other documents that we have provided, will provide. Um, please let me know what questions I can answer. I have one quick question. I noticed the um, energy storage mit risk mitigation strategy was, up was updated. Uh, can you tell me what the changes are in that strategy from what was or maybe maybe it's best to explain the strategy and then at the same time tell me how it's how it's changed. Sure, sure. Um, I know Corey, you are a little closer to this than I, so maybe if you could just who wouldn't mind explaining some of those those changes. Yeah, absolutely. So Thanks. the important thing to keep in mind with that document, Mr. Chairman, is that that is a very high level document intended to provide guidance on what to do in certain scenarios. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of concrete response steps and procedures, those are more captured in the emergency management plan, which which, comp which is comprised of, you know, documents from the manufacturer as well as um, any sort of training that we can provide to the fire department. That is something that they had asked for, and we're more than happy to oblige that. Getting back to the risk mitigation strategy, um, we removed the chemical suppression system. There were some concerns about the um, the type of chemicals that would be uh, sprayed in the best container just inter internally to um, quite, uh, quell any fires that would be that would pop up or to um, stop thermal runaway from happening, which is a common not a common thing, but if you're if you do have a situation with energy storage, it's really thermal runaway. So those chemical suppression systems are meant to, they're designed to um, prevent, well not prevent it, but to keep uh, the batteries next to each other cool if one does start to uh, become abused electrically. So we we did remove it um, because there were concerns about if that were to get into the site and, um, you know, out of consideration for uh, groundwater, um, you know, we didn't want to compromise the integrity of that and we're confident that we are not doing so. Um, with the removal of the suppression system, the best container is still NFPA 855 uh, compliant. So you can, they come with and without those systems and so we can you know we're, we're proposing to have one without without the 
foam suppression. Foam suppression. Yeah, correct. And so that this document is is you're right. It's very high level. It doesn't have much detail, and there would be more detailed um, instructions in other documents, right? Correct. Yep. Correct. It's it's meant to be. It's very, meant to be very high level. Yeah. This is thirty thousand feet. Got it. Okay. Um, are there other or other board members have questions about the documents or about um, requests for information from last meeting? Yes, Mr. Meadows. Uh, one simple one, something I mentioned last meeting. Uh, I noticed in the narrative that they're still got our provider indicated for your screening. We yes. Thank you. That, that will be updated in the final project narrative uh, and the final site plan. We uh, one one thing we were considering is to modify that to be a, a holly or some other pollinating tree, uh, and then learned recently that holly is also a favorite food of deer, uh, so it can be pretty inadequate screening if it's uh, totally eaten by deer. So we're investigating what other um, screening might be available for that. Thank you. Any other questions or requests? I, I, I do have a question. Um, yeah. If I remember correctly um, from the site visit, is the intent to cut 41.5 acres of trees? Uh, yes, the, the project area and uh, ancillary kind of margin for shading purposes is about 41.2 acres. That will have to have trees uh, removed. And but the but the project itself is is a quarter of that ten point five acres. The uh, the project footprint, like representing the panels, if you put them okay. all next to each other, yes, that represents represents about the ten acres. But uh, to remove shading consider concerns from within the array itself, they the rows are further apart, so they're more distributed. But the uh, Array itself, if you had, you know, didn't have to do that spacing, it's about 10 acres, yes. So is it absolutely necessary to cut that many trees for the small size panels, so to speak? For this design, it is, yes. Okay. And those trees are being cut to reduce shade. Is that the only reason? It is uh, so that they, the facility can be sited on the property, but also uh, along some of the, the margins on the site plan where you see uh, you know, kind of a gap between the trees that will be left and where there's no array to be placed. Um, that exists there because the uh, we couldn't fit the array there, do it in a safe way or you know, next to, you know, it would be too close to, you know, a resource area or just to leave that open for shade purposes, yes. And, and we also needed to widen and build up the access road that needs to be, I can't remember if it's 15 or 16 feet per Eversource standards. So some of the trees do need, they will need to be removed just so that we can make way for an access road um, that is compliant with uh, Eversource standards. Go ahead, Dave has questions you more? and then I do have some follow-up. Well, go ahead, we follow up question for this. Oh. Sorry. Um, so, initially, with with forty acres being cut and the panels themselves being um, a quarter size of that, would they be centered within these forty acres? Um, I'm asking because I'm trying to. I after doing the walkthrough, and I know we discuss boundaries, but I'm trying to think. Um, would they be centered within these 40 acres? Um, just so I understand the question, meaning the, the array would be in the middle of the 40 acres, uh, yeah. if I'm understanding that correctly. Um, yes. the, way, the way the panels are situated now, and they're oriented in rows uh, running north south, and they're uh, largely within, yes, the center of the, the parcel. Um, there are surrounding parcel that's being left um, untouched, but for the um, space we have available that avoids resource areas, that's where the, the panels will be located. There's uh, a few uh, 
I guess you could view it as not one contiguous area. It's a few sort of broken up areas to avoid what areas, but um, they'll all be uh, situated within the parcel. Yeah. Would it be helpful to have a site plan uh, shared on the screen so that we could view where those panels will be? Would that help you, Mr. Henry? Um, I, not, not necessarily. I mean, they were very good when we did the walkthrough. I'm, I'm just trying to get some further clarifying. Um, I, I do have the map that was presented as well. Um, so on understanding that, um, I, I don't think, um, where are the batteries? Are, are they all centralized to one location or are they throughout the 10 acres? Um, how, how are they centralized away from neighbors? That's a good question. Uh, so some models will have batteries distributed everywhere. Our, our, uh, our proposal has them located on one lo in one location in the equipment pad. Uh, that is, uh, if you look at the, the map, it's the, sort of the gray square kind of in the middle south section off of the access road. Um, that pad is about 811 feet from the nearest uh, abutting residence. Okay. I'll pause and Davey can ask his questions. Yeah, Mr. Sloboder. Go ahead, uh, Mr. Sloboder, yeah, go ahead. No, I unmuted. Um, I, I just want to clarify something from Mr. Henry's question. When um, you, I think you said that the area covered by the panels is 10 acres. And are, is, does that refer to the surface air, the total surface area of the panels? You're, or does, are you referring to the total footprint of the entire project because you referred to spaces between the panels so is if you add all the panels surface area together is that 10 acres or and what happens when you add the spacing between the panels how much is the total area taken up by the panels that's yeah great question great clarifying question um, so yes if you put just the surface area of the panels themselves it is 10.3 acres. Okay. When you distribute them in the way that's needed for the system to, to operate properly, that takes up about uh, 41 acres. Well, slightly less than 41 acres because of the the shading area. So, you know, slightly less than 40 acres because they have to be spread. So you're so you're you're clear cutting 41.2 acres, and the this project is going to occupy essentially. The entire space. Correct. I mean, give or give or take enough room to put up a doghouse. So other other than that, you're it the entire the entire area of that is clear cut for this project is going to have solar panels on it. Well, yes, that's largely correct. Okay. A Thank you. Gaps, but yes. Thank you. The the 25% coverage was completely throwing me off. Okay, thank you. I, I'm, I wanted to ask the same question, Mr. Sloboder, but I'm confused about the answer. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna try this a different way. So if we take the panels themselves are 10, are 10 acres, right? Correct. You know, we're looking at the footprint of where the panels are located and the batteries. That can't be 41 acres because you have space between where that panel is and um, uh, clear cut areas. You cut trees down to give you um, a margin for shade. So there's a, there's, that's not nothing. <laughs> that's some number around as a border. So you don't have four, I, I, I don't think you have 41 acres of solar panel footprint because you have, I'm looking for the solar panel footprint and the battery footprint and how big that is. Got it. Does that I make sense? I yeah. understand. Yes. Okay. So that's, that's accurate. Yes. The, the panel surface area is that 10.3 acres. Right. 
the total area that's within the limit of disturbance is that 41.2 acres. But you're right, there's going to be some area that won't have panels on them. And what we can do is we could we could find that answer out. Um, I don't want to um, say something off the top of my head. Right. Let's so. get that number because I, that okay. is going to be, I think it's going to be substantially less than the 41 acres because you've got to have, you, you have a buffer between the footprint and the closest tree. That is accurate. And um, a portion of that, I think I have that figure uh, for the access road yeah, is about um, yeah. 0.8 acres of access road and then 0.28 acres of gravel path to the third basin. So yes, we can get we can get more clear, yeah. clarity on that for you. That would be, that'd be helpful because it is sobering to think about a twenty that you twenty five percent only twenty five percent of the uh, clear cut area would be solar panels. That hmm. is um, kind of a remarkable figure. To yeah, make. these these are single axis tracking panels, and so those do require a little bit more room. I believe it's fifteen or sixteen feet in between each row of panels because they need to accommodate shading for each other. Mm -hmm. um, Mr. Wachilla, I think uh, we, if uh, Steve Loss or Chris Connolly from Bird and Terra, if they're, if they're on the meeting tonight, um, those are our engineers who have helped us create these plans and they would very likely have these numbers a little bit more readily available than we do. Do you see the, them, Rob? Yeah, so I just sent Steve a uh, panelist invite, and he should be joining shortly. And I'll let Steve cover this, uh, but he did shoot me a quick message on the perimeter area of the panels. Looks like it's about 20 acres or so. Hi, Steve. Mr. Hi, Loss, can you give us your name and address for the record? Sorry, my connection's not that great. My name is Steve Loss, and what else do you want? Uh, just your address for the record. I didn't hear again, sorry. Oh, yeah. Where you live. Where I live, okay. Uh, Edders, Pennsylvania. All right, that's, that's fine. Thank you. Thank you. So you, you're going to give us some information about spacing between the panels. Maybe I can, maybe the way for me to best think about this is how wide is a panel and how much space does it need between it and the next panel? So the, the panel area, um, yeah, let me, uh, the, the perimeter of the panels is 20 acres. If, if you add them all together, um, as Andrew said earlier, they are spaced out. Um, they're placed sporadically around the site. Um, access row widths are roughly 15 feet, just over 15 feet between each row of, of the trackers that go north-south. And then to follow up on what Ms. McCandless said, there's how much space between the panels? Uh, in acreage, uh, or, sure. you'll have, probably have to figure that out later. But just how many feet between one row of panels and the next row of panels? Feet between the rows. Oh, we only got the tail end of that, Steve. Yeah. Uh, just, just it's over, just over fifteen feet between each north-south row of panels. Okay. All right. Does anybody else have questions about the panel siting and the amount of space that's covered? Mr. Slover, any, any more questions on that? Mr. Henry? Not the, not, not the spacing, but I do have follow-up okay. questions. Sure, go ahead. So um, I understand that the applicant will um, pay for their own peer review. May I ask um, who is doing the peer review and what projects have they done before that have been up and running and for how long? So as of right now, we don't have anybody picked. And usually the way it works is we would um, do requests for quotes and different firms would reach out to us, giving us um, price estimates for each 
topic of peer review that we decide tonight. So that's kind of where we're at right now. And usually for other projects, um, the board would sometimes have the applicants um, reach out to the town to make sure that there's an exact dollar amount that has to be paid up front. And that's called a deposit. And usually they pay that amount to us so we can use that money to pay the consultants for the peer review. Um, so that's pretty much where we're at right now. We don't have any, we have a list of firms in mind, but I prefer not to bring that up right now and just consult that at a later time. Um, but right now we're at that stage. We're still pretty early on in that process. Okay, thank you, Rob. Mm -hmm. um, the other question goes to the monitoring. I understand that um, there'll be sensors and there'll be cameras. Um, is this gonna be remotely monitored? Or is it gonna be locally monitored? Yes, this will be remotely monitored uh, from the equipment pad. There'll be a camera situated there and other monitoring devices uh, to ensure uh, the equipment's operating uh, properly, safely. If anything goes wrong, someone can be dispatched right away to, to deal with any, any issues that might come up. But, but the question is, where is your monitoring center? Uh, this is outsourced to a third party. Uh, I don't know that they've necessarily been selected yet, but they'll, they'll typically monitor the facility as they do for other facilities. Uh, and then if there is an issue, they'll make a dispatch to a Pure Sky representative and the local emergency services personnel. And how far away from the site would be the local emergency Pure Sky representative? Um, I don't know that there's anybody living in the area. I live in Watertown, I'm about an hour, 45 minutes away. Um, I know our construction manager lives uh, down uh, near the South Shore. So it would be and, somebody. And it, it it sounds it sounds like Mr. Henry's question is more about emergency responders. Um, is that is that correct? Are you interested in? It is other than other than the fire department, like someone specifically from Pierce Sky. Are there no one local? Yeah. So we so we would work with the fire department and the emergency response services in Amherst to establish if there is going to be a local pure sky representative who that will be um if not we will work with them on the emergency first for and first response procedures well and, and to, the fire department and to more directly answer your question no we, we don't have anybody uh but any pure sky reps who are currently living in amherst or any surrounding towns and can you, can you just give an estimate as to how far or how close is the nearest Pure Sky representative? Uh, I'd say probably about an hour, 45 minute drive. Okay. The, the monitoring, the remote monitoring, are there any remote monitoring companies like within the Commonwealth or in neighbor, neighboring towns? Or is this like, I don't know, I think Corey said you're in Colorado, you're in Watertown, um, somebody else is in um, farther away. Are, are there any monitoring companies local to the Commonwealth or in any of these neighboring towns? Those that monitor specifically uh, PV facilities, I'm not aware of any uh, that are specialized that are located in Massachusetts. That's certainly something we can look into. Uh, I know that we, we've used in the past has been a firm, I believe called Also Energy, uh, they're located at Portland, Oregon, but they monitor, I would believe, hundreds of different facilities across, across the country and have a distributed network of service personnel. Okay. I'm not sure if they will be selecting them for this project, but that's one example. Understood. Other questions? Mr. Meadows, Mr. Sloboda? Nothing. Um, I had a question about, uh, at, at the last meeting, there was a number of questions about the fire in New York. And at the time, the response from Pure Sky was, um, we, really, we really can't give you much information because it's still under investigation. We'll endeavor to provide that information to you when the investigation is complete. Has that investigation been completed? And is the, do we have that report? Was that part of what we received that I just didn't notice. Uh, <clears throat> that is not something that has been sent over to my knowledge that hasn't been um, completed and shared with us. That's something we can share. Uh, as soon as we have it and are cleared to be able to 
distribute that. That's something we plan to do with, with the fire department right away. Fire department, okay. And do we know, if, do you know if, if the, I think it's West, is it Westchester, not Westchester, it's, New, it's a city in New York. Have they completed their, their investigation or their, um, and so they're just compiling the report and we should have it soon or is it still a ways away? My, my understanding is the investigation has concluded. The report is being compiled. The preliminary results are showing that it's, it was something uh, with the enclosure, the way it was uh, set up there. That is a, something from the installation itself. Um, I don't know the details yet. Unfortunately, yeah. I haven't seen anything, but that's my understanding. And so that's something we will receive, well, I hope we, probably, hopefully before the next meeting that we, we have on this. Understood. Yeah, we, we will check in with Palin to see where that's at. If you could endeavor to get that, that would be helpful for the board's deliberation to know about the, the, the results of that investigation. Yes, sir. Mr. Chair, may I ask some follow-up to your question? You sure can. So if I understood correctly, the issue was around the battery storage system. Um, has this applicant reviewed what the issue was in New York and how is your battery storage system going to be different from New York? Uh, we we do not yet have the official results from that. I just heard kind of conjecture of you know what it might be or what they believe it to be. Um, but we certainly absolutely would make sure that whatever those issues are would be resolved before um, moving forward with a product like that for this this project. I, I appreciate that you don't have all the facts from New York, but my question is. Um, just by hearing what happened in New York, is your design similar or the same to the New York design? Currently, the product that we were proposing for this project is the same model that was used in New York. But before we would implement anything like that in the site, we would make sure that any fixes found from that root cause analysis have been addressed in that in that uh, any kind of product redesign. Thank you. Great. Staff, um, Ms. Brestrup or Rob or Rob, do you, anybody have any other questions before we start to talk about peer review? I don't have any other questions at this time. Me neither. Board members? All right. Uh, you know, I think what would be helpful to the board, uh, Ms. Brestrup, if you would just run through the peer review process. I mean, I know that number one, the applicant pays for it. Number two, we decide this, the board decides the topics, right? And, you, and then we give it to the staff to try to identify, um, go, to create a request for proposal, an RFP. And then you, then you guys decide the, the um, I think, it doesn't come back to the board to decide the actual peer review agents or firms, but just go through it and, and give everybody a, a sense of how it operates. Yeah, so um, the board determines the areas that it wants to have studied, and Rob Wachilla and Rob Mora and I put together a recommended list of areas um, for your consideration tonight. And once you decide on which areas you want to have studied, then we will determine um, the appropriate um, way to hire uh, these um engineers or whatever kind of experts they are. They can be um, engineers or uh, wildlife experts or water uh, quality experts or any of the array of things that you might um, have concerns about. And then um, we reach out to people who are expert in those fields. We may need to uh, put out an RFP, but I think that depending on how what the scope of work is, if it's less than a certain amount, we may be able to choose the um uh the specialist um you know just by contacting one specialist or we may have to contact three specialists and get three um proposals and prices um and then we once we decide it, as a staff who we think would be most appropriate to do the work and you know what the what the amount is then we reach back to the um applicant in this case we would reach back to mr reedy 
and we'd tell him, you know, this is the entity that we would choose to do this work, and this is how much it's going to cost, and this is the entity we would choose to do this work, this is how much it would cost. And then um, <clears throat> Mr. Reedy and the applicant provide the town with um, money that we keep in uh, escrow accounts here, and then the town um, hires the consultant, whatever field that consultant happens to be in, and the, that consultant works for the town, um, really for the Zoning Board of Appeals, but for the town. Um, and they do an examination of what the thing is that you want to have examined and provide a report, which is considered um, the third party review report. And then those are presented to you. So those would be examinations of many of the different things that on the list that we came up with today. Um, and then we, you know, use up the money that is is in escrow. And if we need more money, then we reach back to the applicant and ask ask for more money to supplement those escrow accounts. Um, generally speaking, I think that, well, I shouldn't, I shouldn't say, <laughs> I shouldn't estimate, but it's, it's not a huge amount of money normally, because what they're doing is they're reviewing the work product of someone else. They're not producing the work product. So they're not doing the stormwater management report, or they're not doing the, you know, uh, the phasing design. They're analyzing what, um, what Pure Sky has uh, put forward to see if it makes sense, to see if it's within the industry standard and if it's done safely and correctly according to engineering practices, et cetera. Um, and then, uh, so you get the reports and then you can do with them what you what you think you should do. Does that, um, does yeah. that explain it? It does for me. Is there any questions from board members about that process? Okay, great. That was, that was very good. Thanks, Ms. Prestro. So I think it'd be helpful to see the, I know we all have, there were several suggestions for peer review um, in the last meeting, but I think that we should start off with your list and then we can look at each of the list that the staff compiled and we can look at each of those and decide whether that's uh, where we want to go and if we want to add more to that or not, or if there's something we don't need. But so, I so, so Mr. Chairman, I can screen share um, and show you that <laughs> list. Um, just so we can all take a look at it together. Um, That'd be helpful. Yep. All right. So can everybody see my screen? Mm -hmm. yep. Awesome. So I guess I could just go through each of these topics real quick and just the justification for including on this list. So the first topic is site design. Um, this one's more general, just to get an idea um, of the site layout and make sure that it's, you know, sufficient enough and also, you know, abides by um, what's needed for the paneling in terms of setbacks and pretty much everything we discussed prior to this to make sure that it's all, you know, accurate and, and complete. Um, not saying that's not, but it's always good to double check. Uh, construction phasing is the next one. Um, so there were some concerns brought up about the phasing. Um, so areas that will be included in this are tree removal um, because they're proposing it within like 20 to 30 days in certain areas. Um, there's two different phases in the construction uh, phasing narrative. There was a phase A and then subsection phases. So there'd be like a phase 1A, 2A, 3A. And each of those numbers are a different geographical area on the site. So phase A portion would be removing and clearing out land. And then phase B would be installing the panels and the access road and the equipment pad. So under construction phasing, all three of those topics would be observed and analyzed. Um, the next area is impact to wetlands. And uh, there is reports of a possible stream, has not yet been confirmed, but possible stream along the access road. Um, but that review, it was included just to give you an idea that we're thinking about it, but it might be wise to potentially put that one on hold because they're still at the review with Conservation Commission. And it's possible Conservation Commission might also impose their own peer review on that topic as well. So just to keep that in mind. Uh, the next topic we have is their stormwater management plan and having that looked at. Um, and there's three different areas that would be included in this as well. So you have during construction, and usually what you'd see during construction are your erosion and sediment controls, as well as evaluating the uh, stormwater pol pollution prevention plan, otherwise known as a SWIP. 
So that's one area that'd be looked at. The other area would be post-construction, which is the evaluation of the stormwater management and performance plan. So basically what, what exists after they're done constructing for stormwater runoff mitigation. And the third, which should be its own uh, category, I apologize that it looks like it's subsection C right here, but impacts the water quality, groundwater quality. And uh, there were some concerns from neighbors about their drinking water being affected from this project. So it'd be wise to also consider that as a, a topic as well, and to have an expert look at that and see if this project will impact groundwater. Uh, next, we have glare study. There have been concerns about glare resulting from these large scale projects. Um, we think, staff think that it's wise to, for the board to consider that as well. We have battery storage as a possible topic, including placement, access, fire safety, and hazardous materials containment. Seeing that the applicant has reduced the size of their battery storage on site, um, the board, it's up to you as the board if you want to consider that one as a topic. You know, we could definitely remove it or keep it up to you. Um, and then, Chris, I don't know if you want to explain the last two. Um, you're more familiar with the um, the attorney review during this process, as well as the third-party construction monitoring. Would you be able to give some updates on that? Yeah. Um, so uh, legal fees for uh, land use attorneys are allowed <laughs> as part of this um, Chapter 44, Section 53G. And what we're thinking about is having an attorney from our town attorney, but it could be another attorney as well, um, come to the public hearings uh, and hear what the topics are and advise the board on conditions um, and make sure that the board remains in compliance with Chapter 40A, Section 3, which gives um, some exemptions from zoning regulations to solar installations. So just to make sure that um, you know, you're uh, abiding by whatever regulations you need to do to um, to stay out of trouble and you know not not uh, subject yourselves to uh, an appeal based on the conditions that you um, Im impose. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other one is um, during construction, uh, we think it might be a good idea to have a third party monitor the construction to make sure that everything is done appropriately so that you've got your proper um, erosion control and sedimentation control and your everything is being done according to the plan. Um, so that's another thing that you can consider. Um, you might also consider imposing that as a um, condition, but I don't think, I'm not sure that that would be covered by chapter 44, section 53G, if you made it a condition um, to have a third party construction monitor. So it might be better to just, um, to sort of put it into this mix here. And then, um, you know, when construction actually does occur that you could hire the third party monitor at that time. And Steve, we can also, um, this list is not permanent. We can take stuff out if the board feels that's not necessary to have it peer reviewed. Um, as Chris mentioned, we could have third party construction monitoring as a condition if the board feels that's a lot easier to manage and have the applicants um, work with the town after the fact to arrange that. Um, and then of course the legal fees, uh, for the attorneys to help with conditioning on this project, that's something to, con to consider as well. So, um, I guess that's pretty much it from our end in terms of presenting this. I'll leave this up. The board members can, you know, discuss as you will. Um, and yeah, take it away. Steve. One quick question for Ms. Brestrup. Normally I'm not worried about going beyond our uh, mandate and our on conditions. We've gotten pretty good with that, but there are, there are significant differences in what we can do with the solar fields than, than we would do with a normal, um, and the, the flexibility we have with a normal uh, special permit application and the conditions we impose. And that's caused by state law, right? And if we're not very familiar with it, it might be pretty good to have somebody kind of watching over, who's very familiar with the limitations that are in state law for the ZBA to impose conditions um, on a solar array. So that's really what that's all about, right? That's correct, yep. yep. Yeah, yeah, that's not a bad, not a bad thing to do, I think. Um, 
And, and the I area, just... Steve, that you might see overstepping during this process, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Um, oh, go the, ahead. The area that you might see the board possibly overstepping, if at all, would be in the conditions portion mm -hmm. of this whole process, because other towns I've seen conditions go pretty extreme to where they lost an appeal to the applicant because of that. So, I mean, that's something to keep in mind as well. And that's what, that's, that's the benefit of having the legal review during that process of the hearing. And would the, um, the newly identified peer review topic number five cover everything from on, from potential groundwater effects from construction also to if there is some kind of leakage from a battery, um, plus potential groundwater implications for local residents from the lith, I don't know, the lithium batteries or the oil or whatever, the, the kind of substances that are in the, the batteries themselves that may affect water quality for their wells. I mean, I just want to, I want to make sure that that is something that's reviewed. Is that, is that contained in five? Is that contemplated to be contained in number five? You can spell out what you want to have reviewed. So if that's something that you're, you know, really concerned about, that is something that we can have include there. Yep. And really, again, what it's doing is saying these, these folks are either are or are not using industry best practices is really what, what we're looking at here, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. And Mr. Chairman, just to uh, further clarify, so usually when we do these um, RFPs, if we're doing that route, um, we'll include as much detail as possible. So we'll, we'll include these different areas to focus on within the impacts, the water quality topic, or same thing with stormwater management and the other topics as well, just to make sure that we're as specific as possible and nothing is missed. Got it. Okay. Do people have questions about Mr. Meadows? I see your hand. Yep. I, I, <clears throat> as much curiosity as anything else, but um, I'm wondering how they came up with the decision to use a tracking and monitoring system, tracking system for the solar as opposed to a stationary. And what, what the difference between uh, a similar, um, basically size system in a stationary system as opposed to a tracking would result in as far as a footprint um, and knowing that a tracking system is logically more likely to have mechanical problems, what, um, which, which is um, their problem, not, not the town's problem, obviously, but um, what, what prompted them to use this type of system as opposed to a stationary system? And I don't think it's within our purview to ask, but I am very curious. Um, so that's more, that's kind of a question for the applicant as opposed to a, a peer review topic, right? It could be either way. If you had an yeah. engineer to do the similar analysis on a stationary yeah. system as opposed to a tracking system, if we're looking uh, to see what the footprint might be um, with that type of system, um, it could be it could yeah. be peer review or it could be simply a question to the applicant uh, if they chose to answer it. I'm happy to answer that, Chair. Uh, Judge, if that'd be helpful. I, that'd be a good start. I, what I was going to suggest is we, we could put it on our list for the time being and um, not, yeah, but let's get an answer first. Let's get an answer. Sure. sure. No, it, it's a very good it question. It may not be um, sufficient, but let's find out. Sure. No, it's a very good question. Um, so it is true that with a, uh, I guess the terminology is fixed tilt versus single axis tracking with mm -hmm. a fixed tilt system, which is obviously doesn't move. Um, there are more panels. Uh, so you have uh, more generation potential because you just have more panels in the location. So they can be tighter together. That is, that is a true statement. Um, for tracking, however, even though you're spreading them out further apart, with fewer panels, you're actually getting more production, more energy than you would 
with the fixed tilt system. Uh, that's just because uh, I think, as I said earlier, it kind of tracks the sun over the course of the day rather than a fixed system, uh, fixed system, which, you know, you're only getting maximum efficiency on, uh, during a narrow band of the, of the day. So that's the short and sweet of it, but um, I'm sure we could dive in deeper if that's helpful. It would be pretty much a, a formula that you could, that could be created to t give you the answer to that, right? Because it'd just be a single point versus a, um, an arc. And you can tell it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be that expensive of a, uh, a peer review to, to, be, uh, to understand, to answer Mr. Meadows' question, I wouldn't think. Is that right? Agreed. Uh, I, I would assume they've already done the analysis. Uh, agreed yes it, it was the analysis uh, previously where we looked at both solutions both options um can you, can you and, provide that to us uh, uh is, we, we that, can uh, yes sir that, we, we could work something up um it was more of just internal um file sharing we didn't do an internal report but we can certainly um we can generate something to provide yes uh, i think at the end of the day the important takeaway is that if we were to go with a fixed tilt system, it will require more space to generate the same amount of energy that the tracking system would. Mr. Meadows, would, would that, would that satis, uh, satisfy your, your interest or would you like to have it uh, reviewed by somebody else? No, if, if I could see their analysis, that would be fine. I have plenty of people that can look at it. Great. And then if, and if it's insufficient, we can always come back and if it's important, we can always come back and look at it again and seek a peer review if needed. Are there other questions or comments about this? I, I do, Mr. Chair. Oh, good. Mr. Um, Henry, under, go number, under number five, um, I, I believe right in the packet, there's some of the butters who use geothermal for heating combined with their well. Can we add that to number five, the impact on geothermal? Sure. And on number nine, can someone help me understand why this would be outsourced versus using town resources? For the third party construction monitoring? Yes. Uh, Chris, you want to answer that question? It's a lot of work. The mm -hmm. site is very big. We have really one person um, who does monitoring for um, stormwater and wetlands issues. And we have one or one and a half people who does monitoring for electrical. And we have, you know, a couple of people who do um, inspections, but we don't really have enough of a staff to devote, um, you know, significant resources to this project over a period of time. So having a third party uh, monitor would be, um, would, would provide, the town with a better oversight of what's going on. Understood, thank you. And also, Everill, just to add on to that, the Conservation Commission does this with a lot of their projects too. So they'll have a third party reviewer go check out construction or whatever um, project they're associated with. Okay. <laughs> One area that, I, that was a lot of questions about at the last meeting I noted was on security and fences and monitoring and cameras. And I don't see any uh, peer review of that. Um, I haven't noticed that any board member has raised that question during this meeting. Um, are people interested in um, sort of best in class, um, real time monitoring of the site after it's been constructed for, you know, damage, hail, animals, vandals, I don't know, is, is this, is, are people interested in having more, better, better uh, um, information and monitoring of the site post construction? Or are you satisfied uh, where it's at? Cause that discussion took place last, uh, in August. I'm not I, looking to add to it, I just wanted to make sure we didn't miss it. I, I think that, that that is the applicant's problem. Yep. If they if they have a situation where they get animals disturbing their system or or they have a failure in the 
a panel or they have an inverter or two that go bad or, uh, you know, they're not getting transmission. I'm not certain where the transformers are for this, but um, if, if they have those problems, that's, they're losing power and it doesn't, it doesn't affect the town whatsoever. It just affects their, their profitability. Got it. I don't have security con concerns questions either. I I, I do have a comments because um, I, I read some of the statements from the public and um, some of the concerns were that in current state, a lot of people utilize the force for, you know, walks and hikes and their animals. And I imagine when this is, if this is approved and it's up and running, that will change for these neighbors. Um, and I know from the site visit that, you know, there is, there will be a road that goes in there and it is, is the intent here after, if this is a proven up and running, um, are these residents now gonna have you no know, trespassing signs posted or or how, how does that change, you know, what they do now? Yeah, Mr. Mr. Chair, if if I may, um, yeah, that's a that's a great question. Thank you, Mr. Henry. Um, it is important to note that this is private property, and it is made available at the discretion of the landowner. Um, we we will need to have signs posted because of uh, security concerns. You know, warning, high electricity, high voltage. Um, and also contact information for if there is an emergency. Um, so there will be some signs posted along the gate where exactly those will be um, need that will be part of you know national electric code um, as well as what the board decides. Some boards will decide to have signs posted every 50 feet along the exterior fence. Um, if it's up to if the board would prefer to just have those signs located near the gateway um, and then close to the equipment pad, as long as it's compliant with the, you know, all codes and standards, that's fine with us too. Um, but again, this is private property um, and it is at the discretion of the landowner whether to um, allow abutters and the public onto their property. I'm not sure if that answers your question or if I'm if I'm frozen. <laughs> no, it, it does. Thank you. I, I think there are people listening, so I think it's um so thank you for that answer. Yeah. Okay. Well, it looks like we have um so I'd like to get a, a sense of the board uh, regarding these peer review topics. These look these look like reasonable um requests on our part um, that, and there are things that are beyond my um, my knowledge and I would a peer review would be helpful oh I had one I, I just thought of one thing I'm sorry <laughs> Adams Brook the brook that runs outside the property um, where is that going to be on uh, where is the um, and who has can, who has responsibility for making sure that this does not affect Adam, the water quality of Adams Brook. Uh, that we had that was that was brought up in the uh, on the site visit, and we didn't get an answer to it. And that maybe, and, and I want I don't want to lose that, so I'm going to ask that question now. Who, who has responsibility to ensure that Adams Brook is um, their water quality is not affected, either through construction or post construction? I just answer that question for you, Mr. Chairman. I put it in impacts to water quality. That would probably make sense to include in that area as well. And the stormwater management plan portion, um, I believe they consider runoff that goes towards Adams Brook in, in their analysis as well. Mm -hmm. So it'll be kind of covering those two areas, but in terms of water quality, um, it probably should be added to number five, unless uh, Chris, you have some other suggestions. No, I agree with you. And generally, that would, that's CONCOM that would deal with that in general, but um, this would be something that we would 
for this particular project, we, we could get the information uh, through this. Because you may not, the CONCOM may not have jurisdiction depending on, you know, the situation yep. with the ANRAD. Got it. Okay. All right. So one, I have, uh, I'm comfortable with this list. I'm comfortable with this one list. One more question. Oh, yes, Mr. Henry. So, so I got to get this. Um, I'm sorry I didn't see you. I've got to increase my size okay. so I see it when your hand's up. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so I, I'm going to preface this question with saying, understanding that this is not your choice, but to the applicants, um, looking at this list, um, do you think it's unduly burdensome and or do you think there's anything that you'd like to add on to it that could help your case? Uh, I can feel that. Um, no, I, I think this is a pretty comprehensive list. Um, I think the comment was made earlier that I believe a good chunk of these for the impact of wetlands will be covered through the uh, potentially through the CONCOM process. So in, if there can be efforts to remove redundancy, I think we'd appreciate that. But uh, I think whether it's through the CONCOM or through this, you know, through the board, uh, we're happy to address that. And one other thing to note is um, we would really appreciate to have, you know, our engineers, uh, Steve and Chris, um, work directly with the peer reviewer um, just to maintain efficiency and to make sure that nothing is lost in translation. Um, so we, we would just like to make sure that, you know, we can have that line of communication, understanding that everything would be communicated to the board. Yes, just in case there were any uh, clarifying questions and any resulting uh, modifications that need to be needed, it would be very much helpful for us to have it not be a purely siloed process so we could adapt quickly and accurately, please. Mm -hmm. Does it sound like that's a problem? All right. So unless there's any other, any further discussion on the peer review topics, um, I would like to entertain a motion to approve these lists of peer review topics and instruct the staff to begin um, the process of obtaining peer review on these items for our further consideration. Do I have so, a motion? So moved, Mr. Chair. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? If not, the vote occurs on the motion. Chair votes aye. Mr. Meadows? Aye. Mr. Henry? Aye. Mr. Sloviter? Aye. Uh, Mr. Um, <laughs> I forgot. It's, it's not here. We have one absent. Um, so the vote is four, zero, it was one abstention or one absence. The motion carries. Um, Mr. Gilbert, I'm sorry, I'm a little slow today. Um, so we now have, um, we completed that. The next order of business is public comment on this application. Um, and I would like to, so if members of the public wish to speak on the, um, on the application itself, on the project, um, they can, this is the time to do that. Um, please keep your remarks. First of all, raise your hand, or if, you, if you're on the, on the computer, raise your hand. If you're on a phone, press star nine. Uh, when you are recognized, please give your name and address for the record. All comments should be addressed to the board and not to the indiv not to individual board members or to the applicant. And um, please keep your comments to about three minutes. And so who do we, and staff will help us identify. Who's up? Mr. Wachilla. So the hand that I saw go up first was Renee Moss. So I will go ahead and give speaking privileges. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes, we can. Ms. Moss, go ahead. Hi, my name is Renee Moss, and I'm at 277 Shootsbury Road. And um, this is just going to be a quick comment. Um, as you went down your list for peer reviews, um, I am struck by the fact that there was nothing about an environmental impact study or environmental impact review and also a noise assessment, a noise review. So um, I think that 
those would be extremely important, and especially in, in Conway, where there was a, an array put up, there was a real noise issue after it went up. And the, the, actually, the, the, um, the grid had to disconnect the whole array because, they, they, because of the, the noise for all the residences that were nearby. So I, um, in either case, I think that those two were sort of glaring to me that those were left out of the list. So that was a short comment. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ms. Moss. Um, I see we have another one up. Uh, Rob, would you bring in yep. Ms. Eisman? Uh, Judy Eisman, I'm going to allow to talk. Yes, can you hear me now? Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. I'm Judy Eisman. I chair the planning board in the town of Pelham. Um, the, our board met this morning and we have been talking about this project for a bit. We have some major concerns and what I propose is that I write a letter to the board, the ZBA, um, outlining some of our concerns. But like uh, Mrs. Moss, who just spoke, um, I was concerned that you had no environmental impact uh, as a peer review need. Uh, and let me just say, the CAPS program, which is conservation assessment and prioritization, something out of UMass, uh, ought to be looked at. This particular section of Pelham, which this project abuts, um, is extremely important to wildlife habitat and um, is a high priority area for, con uh, for prioritization for protection. Um, and so I think that along with studies that have recently been completed by the state and DOER, uh, Mass Audubon and Harvard, uh, should be something that you would want to look at uh, in, in terms of areas of studies that need to be uh, reviewed. And uh, the final thing is the idea of um, best management practices. Uh, for, Stormwater just isn't enough. Um, as it happens, it was my son's property who was destroyed, which was destroyed by the um, a solar array built uh, without enough monitoring on site during construction and following it. And so I have a firsthand understanding of what can happen on steep terrain when uh, things aren't done absolutely correctly. And so as to the BMPs, I think what we need is some better management plans, not just the current best management, because the best management plans for this kind of work in forests doesn't take into consideration what goes on with a solar array. And so my concern there is that you have to look at this as a new, a new kind of project. The old best management practices really are insufficient. That's all I will say right now. But I, I, I think uh, if that's if it is all right with you, I will address uh, a somewhat lengthy letter that the planning board in Pelham is preparing, and I will send that to you as soon as we can get it done. Great. For your consideration, okay? Yep. Thank you for your comments, and we look forward to your letter. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. you got so we have uh, one more person with their hand up, Lenore Brick. Apologies. Right. Hi, everybody. Thank you for your due diligence here. Um, I would like to echo what the prior two um, uh, speakers just said. I agree that we need more of an environmental impact peer review. I agree that this is a very new kind of project. And, and just to keep a couple of things in mind as you review this, we're in a very interesting point in history with our understanding of climate science uh, changing, evolving, and the priorities at the state level are evolving. So know that, um, know this little piece about chapter 40A section three is that it is currently being challenged at the state level um, because it's an archaic law when people you know, we're thinking about aesthetics and, and solar rooftops and not even, you know, which is crazy, but besides that, um, not even thinking that there could be a large ground mounted solar installation uh, by clear cutting a forest that was not even in anyone's radar 
Um, and that that law was that exemption was added uh, to the Dover Amendment in 1985. It's being challenged right now, and it could it could be struck from our our legislation. And so to be influenced heavily by the fear of a lawsuit um, would be a shame, right? If that's if that's a, a big piece of your thinking. So just keep that in mind that that's happening right right now as we as we speak. Um, so keep in mind that the state is looking very differently at these projects than they used to. I wish that the state would have subsidized and and maybe they will um, landowners to steward the land for climate resilience and biodiversity that hasn't happened yet, that they would support solar developers uh, more in installing unbuilt landscapes, that more funding is needed for that. That's also uh, an effort that's happening at the state level, just to know, just for you to know. And I'm wondering with the peer review process, this is probably not possible, but interesting to entertain that uh, are there soil scientists and forest ecologists that can determine the impact on the soil health that is inevitably gonna kill the soil microbiology, because that's what is going to happen, such that after the solar arrays are decommissioned in 25 years, that land will not be able to support a healthy forest ecosystem for generations to come. And that's our responsibility, right? To be stewarding this land. I know it's private, but um, I, 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 I would hope that that landowner would have support in stewarding it in this way. I'm working hard at the state level with my uh, fellow organizers to do that. Um, and in this era uh, of, really immense flooding and drought, um, how the loss of these trees are going to uh, impact the health of that, of the land and the surrounding land. Because just like people, trees need community to fulfill their potential. So I just leave you with a of those kinds of thoughts as you think about all of these details that you're thinking about. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Brick. Mr. Wachello, who do we have next? Uh, Michael Lipinski. Hi, my name is Michael Lipinski, 167 Shootsbury Road in Amherst. And uh, thanks for coming by the other day and visiting the forest. I would say that um, there's been an interesting development here over the past couple of days, and it was kind of glossed over a little bit tonight. And I think it's the fact that the applicant has done a 56% reduction in the proposed number of batteries they were going to use. I was thinking that maybe they did that because they were because they were planning to use these batteries that tend to burst into flames and they were trying to reduce the danger of that happening by 56%. But that wasn't the case. The, it seems like they're doing it for financial reasons. And you should let that sink in. The fact that this company's coming to you and basically telling you, we've got financial troubles. The troubles are so great that we've had to reduce the batteries on site by 56%. Well, if that's a, a budget cutting measure that they're planning to do, which in the long run is severely going to affect their income. What other budget cutting things are they thinking about doing that could affect the safety of the project, that could affect it actually getting finished in a way that would be an acceptable project for the town of Amherst? That's a big change. 27 very large battery units, even though they are fire prone and reducing them to 12 is a huge change. It was just sort of presented in as kind of a matter of fact thing. Imagine if they came next week and said, we want to do a 56% reduction in the number of solar panels or a 56% reduction in the uh, number of trees we're going to cut down. All those are major impacts too. And you have to wonder what's coming down the line if the company's basically saying to you, we have budget troubles with this project. There's a reason why they do. It's a poor site for a solar facility. It has been from day one. They know it is. They're trying to fudge as much as they can to make it work. And But it's not a good site. If you took a good look at the site on your visit last week, 
you could look and see, this doesn't make sense. I have just one question to wrap things up. It's the same question I've asked at the last few meetings. How many trees are going to be cut down to put in 10 acres of solar panels? 41 acres are gonna be cleared. 10 acres worth of solar panels are going to be put. I understand it's the surface area, but all that's irrelevant. That's how much surface area of solar panels. I wanna know how many trees are gonna be cut down on this 41 acre site to put up 10 acres of panels. Thank you, Mr. Lipinski for your comment. All right, uh, so Rob? Sharon Weisenbaum. Hi, thank you. Um, Sharon Weisenbaum, 86 Henry Street in Amherst. Um, I just want to echo and mirror what everyone has said previously and build a little bit on what Lenore Brick said about the archaic Dover Amendment and the changing landscape of, um, of large-scale solar development through clear-cutting forests and point out that just recently, um, Peter Shem won a case in land court. Um, no, they, they didn't want to allow clear cutting of their forests for a solar development. And they were sued for saying no, and they won in land court, really simply because they were clear cutting forest in order to put up this solar development. So it really is a changing landscape. And I think it's really important for Amherst officials to know that because I think it can reduce our fear of lawsuits. And then I also wanted to ask, I know that um, these solar sites are frequently sold. And in fact, in Shutesbury, the Wheelock site has been sold three times since it was built. So I was listening to the plans, the safety plans that Pure Sky has in place but I know that in Shutesbury, once it's sold, all the commitments that the company made who wanted to build it suddenly were gone. And many of those commitments were never followed through on once it was sold. So I wonder um, about Amherst um, taking care that there's a long-term plan in place in case these sites are sold, that we can't just rely on Pure Sky, we have to have a plan in place if the site is unfortunately built and then if it is sold. So thank you. Thank you very much for your comment. Um, Rob, I think we have one more. Yep, Jacob okay. Hirsch. Hello, thanks for uh, letting me make a comment. Um, I live on Flat Hills Road in North Amherst. Um, I was very surprised that you're not um, asking for a peer review for um, traffic engineering. Um, how are they gonna get all of those trees out of there? They're either gonna take a right and go through Shutesbury on a dirt road, or they're gonna take a left and go along residential roads through Amherst. Shutesbury Road has erosion problems in a couple of spots, and I'm sure those huge logging trucks aren't gonna help it. So I think the town whose roads are not in the greatest shape should protect itself by doing some sort of uh, road roadwear study and traffic study. I also think that um, you should ask for clarification on how they're gonna get the trees out of the woods when they cut it. The single access road, which is 15 feet wide, how many trucks are gonna go over that every day and for how long to get the trees out of there? I don't understand that you're gonna be able to do that within the time of the phasing that you, that you showed on the plans last week to the planning board, but at any rate, please consider that because that has huge impact on the neighborhood and on the town streets and other neighborhoods as well. 
Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hirsch. Okay. I don't see any other pub, uh, any other hands up. Or nothing from the phone, Rob. Okay. Nope. All right. Um, we typically give the applicant, if they wish to respond to the public comment, a chance to do so. You can either do that now, or you can do that at a later at the next meeting. If you need to collect your thoughts, it's up to you. Oh, thank you for the opportunity. I'm sorry. I don't want to miss some of those questions. I'm happy to respond in the future meeting. Okay. We'll, uh, and we'll, so we have those questions down. Rob, will you um, just kind of over the next couple of days shoot those questions to the applicant so they can answer some of those questions? We'll do. All right. So I don't want to go, let them go un, unanswered if we have the opportunity. All right. Um, I don't, there's nothing else for this matter before us tonight. We've taken our peer review vote, we've had public comment, and we've uh, gone through the new material that's been submitted. Um, it's going to take a while before um, the next, the material that we need to review next will be available, and the con -com and the conservation and the uh, uh, matters are going to take some time to, to uh, be processed. So I think we have to pick a date um, sometime in December. We only have one meeting date in December. Um, I think is, that's right, isn't it? Only one, or do we have two in December? So as of, um, trying to think. So we have, in terms of regular meetings, Mr. Chairman, or just all meetings of the zoning board? Regular meetings. So in terms of meetings in December, we have two scheduled. And they should be the second and fourth Thursday, because I believe the third Thursday might be that's Christmas 20. time. That's twenty third. I, um, I think that's so. The first one I have not done in my calendar in front of me. Mm -hmm. Yep. That's so what? actually, so it's looking like it's the fourteenth and the twenty eighth of December. Those are the two meetings for December. And do we have things already scheduled for those? Not yet. No, because the forty B meetings are going to be on the seventh and the twenty first. Right. So it's going to be missing those days. Um. Let's look. The 14th and the 28th. Mm -hmm. Do you have time? Does the 14th give you enough time, Mr. Shavo, to um, get the information that you're going to provide to us? Uh, yes, sir. I think that uh, to just frame what you are all expecting for that meeting, if the expectation is to be totally done with all the peer reviews, I, I'm not sure. I'm not um, sure. That was going to be my next question. I doubt we can be done with the peer review at that point. Okay. Then um, we can absolutely be working towards getting more um, to you, but uh, some of the things that are, are a little bit more engineering intense, like the site plan, storm our plan, you know, the, the interaction with the with the peer reviewer probably, if there's any modifications to be needed, might take a little longer. So we can certainly provide anything that has been completed by that. Is there enough? Is it going to be enough to warrant a meeting to devoting a meeting on the fourteenth? Um, I would say. Um, I think. What do you think, Rob? I mean, it may not be enough to do, uh, and, and we, there's a, we got other stuff that we need to to work on. Just thinking about the process of get of doing the peer review. So, if we were to submit a request for proposals or quotes, um, that might take about three to four weeks by itself because we need to give people time to respond to us, then we have to review the different quotes and then choose consultants and um, do a bunch of contracting and stuff and then get payment from the applicant and then uh, pay the consultants and have them do their work, which typically would take probably about a month, I would say. Um, depends on the size of the topic they're investigating. So if possible, I would suggest maybe either late December, early January as the next meeting date that probably would be the move. And I believe the first meeting in January is January 11th, which is not a holiday that I'm aware of. If it pleases the board, I think that if we were opting for uh, a late December date, we could endeavor to get as much done as possible and uh, make this a number one priority for us to get, get you what we need. 
Because you know the the difference between that early that early December date and the late one is two weeks, which a week, one week of which is the holidays, mm -hmm. and tough to get. I mean, it's just being realistic. There's just not as much work that gets done. At least I don't. I, I was never able to accomplish all that much um, during those holiday times. At least it was a fraction of what you could normally do. And I know you. I know you would like to get this done as quickly as possible. But I think it's a real waste of time to put us out there before you. You have a chance to review the peer review things. Um, unless there's a number of other issues that we have to address at that meeting, and I don't. I don't see that there are enough issues to warrant a meeting by itself. Maybe the January 11th would be the best use of our time, and then we're not doing it. We're not having two meetings when we can maybe get it all done in one. Other board members have any other feeling contrary to that? I'm looking at the, at the January time for continuing the hearing until that date. Seems to make sense, doesn't it? Mr. Meadows? Oh, you're muted. muted. I am out of the country from the 27th of December through the 14th of January. Let's see. Okay. Let's look 14th of January. I am out of the country from the 18th of, uh, yeah. I leave on the, I leave on the 18th of January, I'm out of the country for two weeks. So, Mr. Chair, would it be wise to do like a check in on the 28th of December just to see where we're at with everything? Um, gives the applicant time to respond, give us updated documents. Um, us staff can update you on the peer review process to see where we're at so far. Um, just keep the board informed and the public informed too. What do you think about that? I can. Yeah, we can do that. Otherwise, we're looking at February, right? Yeah, at that point, that's what it sounds like. Uh, I think Chris might have something to add, too. Ms. I Preston. just wanted to acknowledge that Mr. Meadows won't be able to attend, but he could watch the video and, you know, submit a statement that he's watched it. So he won't be available on the 28th of December. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, you're, you're gone on the 28th as well. That's, yes, I got it. I got it. Yep. Okay. Um, so you you're gone for both the two days, the the twenty eighth and the uh, the first January. Correct. Since you're going to be gone for both, and uh, you come back on the fourteenth, if we need to have an under the Mullins rule, can you miss more than one meeting? No. No. Just one. And so far, we have two members on this panel who use their one, yourself and John Gilbert. And Mr. Gilbert. Mm -hmm. And then if we do this, Mr. Meadows will either date, either the 28th or the 11th, Mr. Meadows will have missed one as well. Mm -hmm. um, well, we got to pick a date. So let's pick, let's pick the date that gives us the greatest likelihood of having a productive meeting, uh, and, and both of which have Mr. Meadows' absence, which is unfortunate. Um, and I would choose the, I would choose the January meeting because I think that there's a better chance of having more material available to us than there would be in the December 28th. Um, and I, that's what I would, I would choose. So the next question is January 11th or January 25th? I'm gone so on the 25th, so it has to be the 11th. 11th. Okay. And Craig, you said you're going on the, on the 11th, correct? Right. Okay. So Craig will have to use his Mullins rule on the, on the January 11th meeting, and that could still work and give us enough time to have some reporting done. Hopefully a lot of the reporting done for the peer review. Um, and the applicant has plenty of time to get us any updated materials that we requested from them. And Mr. Meadows, are you, do you have a lot of time in February that you're going to be gone? Does it doesn't take you away in February? At the, I don't know at this point. Yeah, I know it's early, um, but I'm trying to avoid a, a, a second meeting where you, where we'll lose you. And uh, well, I know in 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 April I'll be out of the country also. God, I hope we're not still doing this in April. I would hope not. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> I hope. All right. So let's go for the 11th. And um, I think it's the best we can do. And that also gives us the opportunity, if there are other things that we can clear up on the, on the 28th, we can do that, uh, you know, other more run-of-the-mill special permits. Now we can do that on the 28th. Okay. Um, I would entertain a motion that we continue this here, this public hearing until January, to six o'clock on January 11th. Is there a second? You might want to specify the year, Mr. Chairman. Um, <laughs> yes, I probably, I probably yeah. do. Uh, if yeah. I can remember that it's going to be 2024. Thank you. I got the time. I just didn't get the year right. Okay. Um, is there a, do we have a motion? So move, Mr. Chair. And a second, Mr. Sloviter. I can. Any discussion? No discussion. The vote occurs on the motion. Chair votes aye. Mr. Meadows? Aye. Mr. Henry? Aye. Mr. Sloviter? Aye. Um, and Mr. Gilbert is absent. The vote is 4 0 1. The motion carries. All right. So we've put the first item behind us. Thank you guys, um, everybody from Pure Sky. We appreciate your, your time and attention to this, and we'll be back in touch. Excellent. Can I make one comment before they leave? Yes, of course, Mr. Henry. Yes. Thank you. So um, I appreciate and understand that the issue in New York is still being looked at, but given the fact that your project and your design is somewhat similar. Um, come January, um, I would hope that you have more response than we don't know it's still ongoing. Even if it's still ongoing, I'm putting the onus on you guys to get us more information that you don't know. Yes, sir, we will do that. Thank you. Right. Thank you everyone for your time, really appreciate it. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair, thank you, board. Have a good night. All right, great. Thank you. Have a good have a good evening as well. All right. The next order of business is ZBA FY 2024-04. Charles, Dana, and Roki Zong request for a special permit under section 3.3211 of the zoning bylaw to convert an existing owner-occupied duplex structure into a non-owner-occupied duplex with two rental units, five bedrooms in total, at 62 Taylor Street, map 14B, parcel 74, residence, RG, general residence, zoning district. Uh, there was a site visit this week, which I couldn't attend. Mr. Slobodar, I know you attended it. Can you kind of summarize the site visit for us? Uh, sure. Um, we met the current owner there who showed us around the exterior and she explained, uh, we only looked at the exterior because there will be no interior modifications or additions. So we looked at, it, it was quite a short site visit. We looked at the, um, we walked up the driveway, we looked at the back of the house where there is parking for three cars, a little tight and a little onto the grass and not delineated, but there was only one car back there. And then we walked out front and we looked, we looked on the street and asked a number of questions about the neighboring homes, the house next door, one house next door is a single family home. On the other side, the woman who met us, who seemed very helpful um, and, and very nice, didn't know if that was a multifamily house or not, she said. And there were a couple other buildings on the other side of the street, one that we know is multifamily because it's been before us on another application. And there were a couple of other houses. It's a relatively short block. So there were, it appeared to us to be a number of other multi, uh, multi-family units. But 
it was a it was a quick visit because there's only one thing that as far as i understand and mr henry was the other one there so he can certainly correct me if i'm wrong there's only one thing that they're asking and that is to change the classification from owner occupied to non owner occupied so there wasn't a lot for us to look at thank you mr I henry there you are. Yeah. I concur with everything Mrs. Slover says. Mm -hmm. Great. Good. All right. Um, and Rob, was there any questions that we had to ask? That were asked that we had to have to put into the record? No. Uh, not particularly. I mean, I have. Right. Well, I had a couple written down, but it was mostly about um, asking which properties nearby are two family or multiple multi families or two families, and which ones are. Um, rental properties. So most of the ones nearby are multifamily. I, I confirmed that like 10 minutes ago from looking online. I'm trying to confirm which ones are residential. I'm having trouble figuring that one out, uh, Mr. Slover, but you would assume if they're multifamilies, they're most likely rentals. I just don't know the owner occupancy status of them. I know the, the one across the street that we already looked at was um, owner occupied converted dwelling with the two rental units inside of it already. Oh, it's so, not. It's not currently owner occupied. It's not, but they're they just got right. approved for it. We, so we appro we approved it based yeah. on the new the new unit would be owner occupied. Yes, right. that's correct. Right. And okay. did you find out what um, the property when you're standing in the street facing the property in question tonight? Mm -hmm. What the property to the left of that is. So let me take a look. And that's the property on the corner of Gray Street and Taylor Street, if I'm not mistaken. It um, is one immediately next door to it. Yeah, yep, it's so... it's immediately it's immediately to the left as you're facing the house. Is that actually on the corner? The street is pretty short. I didn't realize that it was the corner. Yeah, it's on the corner. Um yeah. and it's pretty big lot it looks like their access on gray street so it's a gray street property it looks like currently it's a two family um trying to see the occupancy status of that it just says two family they have a attached parking plan and a rental permit so yes that building mr Sovater, that you mentioned um which the address is 56 taylor street is considered a rental property two family so two units non-owner occupied uh, that is correct. Okay. Okay. I may add, just by observation off the street, there are many buildings that has multiple meters that will suggest that they're rental properties as well. Okay. Great. Okay. Thank you. That's a good report, gentlemen. Thank you very much. Um, I want to run through the submissions. We've received from the applicant an application form, a uh, management plan, a management plan for additional information for apartments, a complaint response form, a memo of uh, permission to use the payment for the application dated September 18th, a project narrative, a lease agreement, example of a lease agreement, reference from the neighbor, um, Cheryl Harbison dated August 30th, 2023, a quick claim deed, a plot plan, a mortgage inspection plot, I guess with the parking shown um, from ZBA 20, what is that? Uh, ZBA 2013-28 um, floor plans and the landscape and lighting plan approved in 20, 2013, floor plan of 2013 as well. We have, a, and we have the uh, ZBA staff submission of the decision document, the project application report. Um, Mr. Wachilla. I just want to state for the record, Mr. Chair, that the ZBA FY 2013 I think it was, sorry, 28? Yes, yep. 28. That permit expired back right. in 2017 when the current owners purchased the property. Um, and it continued to be an owner-occupied duplex for a while, but then the current owners switched it to non-owner occupied, but weren't aware of the fact that the permit had expired. Just wanted to clarify that for the record. Yeah, the, the whole use of this property is um, 
a trail that we have to we have to go through. Mm. All right. So, um, is there anything else that we should review before we have the? I think we ought to have the applicant speak and then mm -hmm. we can ask questions about the, the history of the the use of the property. So, who's who's here for to speak for the applicant, or is the applicant themselves here? Uh, so, so Mr. Mora has been done. Yeah. With, oh, Mr. Mora, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to mention that 56 Taylor Street that Mr. Mm -hmm. Sloviter was asking about is actually owner-occupied duplex. Okay. It, it does have a rental unit, but mm -hmm. I don't find anything that uh, changes the owner-occupied uh, you know, listing that it is in in our records. So I, be I believe it's owner-occupied. Thank you. Thank you for clarifying that, too, and for uh, correcting my mistake on that. So um, in terms of who's present, Mr. Chair, there is a few people I can promote to panelists. Um, just yep. if you are the applicant, just, you know, accept the invitation I'm about to send to you. It's not the applicant. Okay. All right. So who is the applicant and who's speaking for the applicant? All right. Okay. Please uh, give your name and address for the record. Sure. I'm Charles Dana. Uh, uh, Roji Jong. Uh, we're at Four Still Corner in Leverett. Mm -hmm. and, um, so we are the, the currently prospective buyers of the property. Um, I'll contingent upon this uh, outcome of this meeting in this permit. Um, so the, the permit has been applied for in RNA. Most of that has been submitted through the uh, current owners, however. Uh, Great. Um, so who is, since you're the, you are the applicant, do you want to just, I, I think probably it would be best if we have the current owner describe the use, the, the history of the use, and then we can go to your, request for the, because um, you want to buy the property, a request for the non-owner occupied duplex status. So it would be helpful to have some history of this before we go into your request. So um, is that, who is representing the current owner or is the current owner on the call? We have Margo and Angela, which is, who is who? I think we, I think we've met with Angela. What's that? Did you meet with Angela? Yeah, we did. Okay, so Ms. McHan, uh, Sarah Pong, can you um, speak to the sort of the history of the use of ownership and use of the property prior to the this proposed sale? Sure, and I apologize for not being able to put my video on. I'm traveling to Maryland um, right now, but I am able to use audio, so I hope that's okay with everybody. That's fine. Um, just give us your, your address. Excuse me? Please give us your address for the record. The address is 62 Taylor Street in Amherst. Is that your address? Are you, you're not currently residing there. Not currently residing there. My current residential address is in uh, 39 Shattuck Road in Hadley. Great. Okay. Thank you. Yep. So uh, my husband and I purchased the property back in 2017. Uh, we utilized it as owner occupied. And then uh, over the course of a few years, and we also had some family members staying there um, occasionally. Over the course of time, we decided to um, utilize it as a rental, not realizing that the previous permit um, on the house had expired. And we're uh, not familiar with the process. So I applied for the normal uh, rental fee, sorry, or the normal rental application. I don't know the proper terms to it. Um, I've been working with, with Rob on the application and uh, we have paid uh, past fees for the rental 
of the house. Um, my husband and I decided to sell the house. Um, and as part of the sale is when we realized that there was not a permit on it. And therefore that's when we applied for it um, after accepting the offer of sale. All right. Before we go to the new owners, are there any questions for the current owner? I think we understand the situation. I just had one question for the current owner. Do you own other rental property in Amherst? For the current owner? I do, do not own rental properties in Amherst. Okay. All right. Um, Mr. Dana and Miss, can you say your last name for me? I mispronounced it when I introduced you. I'm sorry. Uh, Zhong. Ruoqi Zhong. Zhong, okay. Do you wish to please make your presentation? Yeah, sure. Um, so we moved to the area from Chicago just over a year ago. Um, and we had a rental property in Chicago. Um, and we're not happy being that far away from our property. So we've decided to sell that property and invest in something locally um, so we can be close to our investment and maintain it. Um, we both have, well, I have a background in architecture. Um, Rosie is, a, is an architect here in town and um, as a working in the background in public health. And so our interest in the property is to make it, uh, uh, make sure it is maintained as a safe property. We're looking to do some structural improvements um, and electrical improvements on the property. It's, well, the electrical right away, the structural is not an, any sort of eminent issue, but um, we'll be updating that as we can. Um, I'll also say that we've looked at a number of properties, both in Amherst and around, and um, have been a little disappointed um, in, in some of the properties that we saw. So um, we're looking to be good stewards uh, and, and, and make sure that we maintain a good property for tenants. It's not, you know, that goes above and beyond, I think, what uh, is needed by the, the codes. And uh, I don't know if there's anything else you're, you're looking for from us, uh, certainly. Currently, there's there's currently five tenants residing in the building. Is that correct? Like uh, Angela to perhaps respond to that. That is correct. And is you are proposing to keep the same number of tenants? Is that correct? Once it was purchased. Yeah, that's correct. We'll take over the leases that are there. Um, we've met with. I believe all of the tenants and uh, hope that they'll they'll stay on uh, and renew. All right, so it's three and two is what you, for the two units, three, three and one and three and one unit and two in the other unit. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, good, all right. But then, but I, what I want to get from from the new owners, that's what you that you want to keep the same mix, three and two, not four and one, but three and two, correct? That's correct. Okay, good. I guess I just want to make sure that we have the same understanding. I, my understanding is that there's what it's a four bedrooms in the uh, second floor unit and uh, two bedrooms in the uh, first floor unit, so. But the uh, the yeah, I, I noticed the same thing too, and that's why I'm asking the question because I'm in the application we're talking about five tenants, and in the the floor plan it looks like there's four bedrooms in one unit, and, uh, and so I just was not sure if, what if that was a study room, if it was a, or if that you intend to have four there or not. Right now you've you've got five and you have three parking spaces if you had an additional person um you know i just didn't i just want to know what your your plans are so mr chairman um i did notice the materials that were sent to me 
including the management plan, it did say that it was five yep. t bedrooms and then the three and the two, like you'd mentioned. So um, if that's not correct, we could always update those documents or require that they're updated um, and brought back at a future public meeting or something like that. Yep. That would be fine. Okay. I just want to make sure that it's, I want to make sure that the plans are accurate that mm -hmm. submitted to the town, that the yeah. management plan matches up with that. Um, so that's, that was the reason for the question. Yeah, Mr. Question. Chairman, if it, if it'll be helpful to clearing confusion too, I think that, you know, maybe we should instruct the potential buyers on the importance of the management plan, the complaint response plan, and any other materials that were submitted and how the board um, uses those in oh, the special yeah. permit process. And I, you know, how they are required to operate within the confines of those documents that are submitted to us too. Um, I don't know if you want to give some background on that to them. That is that's how we make our, one of the important ways in which we make our decisions on the special permit applications. Um, mm -hmm. In this case, we have a, a special permit application for something that's been in use as a rental property, but it wasn't correctly permitted through um, just an oversight. Um, and nobody's saying anything other than that. But the way we make a decision about this and we approve the special permit is dependent on some things, including the management plan, um, lighting plan. The management plan includes the maintenance of the property, the, the trash, the complaint response plan is really important. Um, and for these, you'll need to have a, you know, you, you need to identify somebody to either manage the property or to be the, um, um, for whom the complaints go to, all those things are important and you have to live up to those. Um, it's it's as, a as a condition of your special permit application. So that's the reason for the questions. And you even have to live up the, um, the layout. Uh, I wanna make sure also that, that um, one of the rooms, so that's the, that's the background. And so one of my questions was one of the rooms looks to me like it, I think it could be used as a bedroom, but it's not, designated as a bedroom. And so if the, in the site plan, I want the rooms are supposed to, as debt should be used as designated on, this, on the floor plan. Uh, and I'm sure as an architect, you understand that's not news, right? Um, but it's really, so number one, it's hard to read the floor plan, but it looks like one of the, where I'm looking for it right now, one of the rooms in the front of the build, the front of the lower unit, looks to me like it could be used as a bedroom um, and that would be in excess of the number of people that, there it is. It's the first floor apartment. You want to put that up on the screen? Yeah, I'm about to do that. Um, excuse me one second. There you go. All right. So this is the first floor plan. Yeah. Um, it's really hard to read. Like you mentioned, oh my really goodness. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. So it's, that's the first thing we're going to need. And we don't, this doesn't have to delay the, the, the approval of the application. But we'll need a better plan submitted to the town so we know what these rooms are, how they're designated, okay? That's a yes? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. We can yeah. agree that. Okay. So what, go through the front entrance. What You enter into, I suppose, a vestibule or a foyer, right? Right there. That's what that is? Yeah, that is a, a common stair. Um, so that would be the, the house's original front entry. Um, our understanding of how it's currently used is that's not the primary entrance. The primary entrance is uh, where that hand-drawn arrow is on the towards the lower left. Got it. Um, and so you enter into more or less a kitchen, kind of a little little area in front of the kitchen, and that is the kitchen there. Um, as you move through the door to your left, that's a family room space. Yeah. And then as you move again to the door up to the upper right, that is the primary bedroom for that unit. Right. And the room to the right of the family room um, is also being used as a bedroom. And so obviously we would want that to be, you know, identified as such uh, if we're going to be taking on this permit, so. Right, so you'll have two people in this unit, two tenants in this unit, and that first but, room, what? It is one, I'm sorry, sorry to interrupt. Uh, it is one tenant, it's a, a family, I believe, that is in there, so. One family, one family. Yeah. Yes. Okay, 
Got you, as opposed to one person. Mr. Cool. Chairman, can I ask a quick question? Yep. Um, so I guess the applicant should state, you know, how many bedrooms you're intending to have in each unit, just for the record, so we can condition that into the permit. Right. Mr. Mr. Sloviter. What is the space that is right under the word front mm -hmm. currently used for? That's the common stair. So that um, also goes up to the second floor unit. And okay. The, uh, one of the means of egress. Uh, so that okay. could not be used as a bedroom? No, no, it's a stairway and a hallway. Okay. okay, thank you. That was the question I had. It looked to me like that could be possibly used as another bedroom. And yep. we that's a problem we have in town is that sometimes inner rooms are used inappropriately as bedrooms to house students and then you have more than a number of people living in the units than is allowed by the zoning file. That's what right. I'm looking for. Okay. Um, all right. And then for the second floor, since we couldn't get in, I, I, we couldn't see it, this is the best we can do to try to determine. So we have three bedrooms on the second floor. That's, yes, that's correct. Um, so for this unit, the primary entrance is um, actually from the deck on the right hand side, um, right. where it says porch. And so you would enter in there again into kind of the kitchen area. Um, and as you move through and go into the living room, off of that, you can see is the doorway to the hallway and the stairs as the second means of egress. And then uh, to the right of that is where it says bedroom two is the larger bedroom on this floor. Mm -hmm. And there's another bedroom um, which says bedroom one. Yep. And then, um, if you travel all the way down to the other side of the kitchen is the third bedroom on this floor. And then uh, there is uh, the bathroom to the right of that. And yeah. there's a stairs up to another level that's on the third level, which is also used as a bedroom. Oh, so you have four bedrooms in on the second unit. So, Mr. Chair, to clarify, it says here, um, and this was a condition from that previous permit, that use of the third floor loft as a bedroom is prohibited yeah. as per that previous permit. So I guess the board should discuss whether or not they wish to permit that loft area as a bedroom. That's something that should be discussed in the condition portion of, of the discussion tonight. Okay. All right. And it, generally, um, Mr. Mora, do we need the, more? The, the, do we need more um, detail to the floor plan to help you determine uh, how the appropriate use of these rooms, or is, is this sufficient for your your purposes? Is there more detail needed? No, I I think with the the way you know, things are being clarified and possibly with conditions and then the expectation that the, the new owner would bring a uh, better quality floor plan. I think all that combined will be acceptable. Okay. Shouldn't be too difficult for two hours. Have, have, have more, uh, have better drawings for us or more legible drawings, not better, I mean more legible drawings. Okay, good. All right. Yeah. Mr. Chair, I, I think April had a question. Yeah. Yep. Who has and, a question? And, and this is for yes, and this is for Mr. Mora. Does this third floor loft meet the criteria for a bedroom? That's that's a good question. I don't know because we, you know, as far as we understood, it wouldn't be used uh, as living space and accessible to tenants. So it would have to be inspected to really know that for sure. I'm looking for the old permit, uh, you know, to see if there was any discussion in it, but I haven't come across that yet. Uh, so at this point, I'm not sure. Okay. I, I think we would need to know the answer to that before we can have a conversation about that third floor space. Yeah. 
Yes. I mean, we don't know the reason that it was not permitted, the living was, was not permitted to be used as a bedroom by the previous special permit. Does, does there have to, is, is there a second egress required on a third floor? Is, is perhaps that why it was not permitted to be a bedroom? I've just, I'm aware of other properties where there's supposed to be another egress. No, not from the third floor uh, itself. If it's part of the second floor unit, so the, the second and third floor together is a, a unit, the two means of egress can be from the second floor, not an additional okay. means of egress from the, the loft. Okay. There does need to be a window, there's ceiling height requirements, smoke detectors, carbon monoxide detectors, there's a bunch of things that, that do need to be looked at to make sure that it does qualify as a uh, usable space for a sleeping room. Okay, thank you. It looks like here there's, I think these are windows, if I'm not mistaken, on, on this floor plan right here. But I think better clarification would definitely be needed. Yeah, there, there is a window right at the, where it says front, mm -hmm. there is a, a window. Um, I believe the others on the left side are really skylights. Um, okay. uh, they're large skylights that, that do open, but they're not for egress. Um, but it is a, a double hung window that um, is, meets the requirements for a bedroom. Okay. Um. So do you want me to keep the plans on the screen, Mr. Chair, or do you think? Oh, you can um, take them down. Okay. Unless, uh, unless anybody else needs to look at them. Um, that's all I need. Okay. Okay. So this is, this is more confusing and complicated than it normally is because of the um, kind of the history of the use. So your management plan It says here, your management plan has five total tenants. So that one tenant is in the basement, that's one. And four tenants in the second unit. That's what your management plan calls for, correct? And right now there's three in the that second unit. There's three renters in the second unit. Or do you believe that the, Angela, is the, the loft currently being used as a bedroom? There was somebody um, staying up there and we requested that when we figured out that we didn't know if they were allowed to stay up there or not, we requested that they share a room, but I'm not sure where that has fallen. All right. And we do have um, somebody that's only going to be in there for another two months. So we figured that there was a short term lease. Um, in it until it became only three tenants. Yeah. Okay. Well, you, you know, I, I, that's going to be a question for the town. But you, I can't decide on how you're going to. You can't, you're not supposed to have somebody <laughs> sleeping up there, so um, you'll have to. And until, unless we change it for the special permit application you don't have a viable bedroom up there on the fourth floor for the new owners, right? Unless the special permit specifically permits it. Um, so I do have one question, Mr. Chair, um, yeah. about a few things just of clarity's sake. So the trash receptacles on site, um, there wasn't really any indication if they were screened from the public right of way. Uh, do you know if they currently are? And if they're not, do you intend on screening them with like a fence or vegetation or just maybe placement while they're not being, you know, on off days from collection days, that is? Is this directed to us? Sorry. Yeah. Um, whoever wants to answer it. <laughs> um, 
from our obser observations from uh, the times that we've been on the site for our inspections, um, the garbage recept receptacles that the, if you remember the plan, there was the porch where you enter the, um, the lower unit and they were being stored, you know, further deeper in the lot behind that porch. Um, so they're not really visible from the street very well. Um, if it's needed that they are actually moved around the backside of the house a little bit further, that's not a, that's only another 10 feet or so, then they would absolutely not be visible. Uh, so if that would be sufficient. Tip, almost always trash, we ask, we require trash receptacles to be screened from the public way. So sure. that would either, it should be in your management plan and it should be a, a, it could be a condition if it's not in your management plan. So I believe Mr. Chairman I might have added that as a possible condition um, mm -hmm. to this permit, but if not, we could definitely include it. Um, but uh, I'm trying to think of any follow-ups. So in terms of the parking area, I did put in that report previously that it was hard to tell if the parking spaces were within eight feet of the building itself. But after going to that site visit, it's definitely it, it can be determined that the closest car is greater than eight feet away. So that's no longer an issue. And it was previously stated in the project application report. And I guess in terms of lighting, yeah. um, are you familiar with the lighting on site, um, Charles or, or Rookie? Um, and do you know if it's downcast in any way? Like, is it? light that could potentially spill over onto neighboring properties or maybe this, this is a question for angela current owner yeah we're not, we're not familiar okay yes the out the uh, lights that are fixed on the side of the house are pointed downwards just into the driveway area good so one of the one of the requirements um for the new owners or the prospective owners is that lights uh, be downcast, dark sky compliant as per our rules, and they don't wash over to the neighbors. So that would be your lighting plan requires that. And you're going to do some electrical work, you said. Is that correct? Yeah, we identified some active knob and tube on the interior of the house that will be uh, remedied. So if you any new lighting on the any new exterior lighting has to be down um, downcast and dark sky compliant. All right. That. Yep. Um, and it sounds like you're doing it anyway. So, and then you would want to have cut sheets and and show us what the, what those are, or show the town what those are. Okay. Um, all right. I don't. I'm wondering if any other board member has questions about this application. I I have one. Yep. So are there any intentions to do something about the driveway slash parking spaces? Because right now on the site visit was like all gravel and um, I, can, I can see some roughness there. Yeah, I, I think that's a little tricky. Um, one of, it, it is a shared driveway with the neighboring property, which is the single family residence. Um, and from what we've seen, there's uh, an arborvitae hedge that screens um, the back ear area where that parking is taking place from the uh, the neighbor's property. That hedge is actually, as it appears, um, well onto the 62 Taylor Street property. Um, we don't plan on moving that hedge, even though it is essentially giving a lot of the, the land that would be um, potentially available to parking. Um, we're kind of giving that, that land is being borrowed by the neighboring property in its current configuration. Um, we certainly want to please uh, the neighbor and their, their house. Um, they're taking very good care of that property. And so, um, we want to maintain the the, the road, uh, the driveway that's there. Um, it gets a little tricky when it's being used by the neighbor as well. Um, if we were to pave it, 
Um, we would have to look a little bit more into how that would actually work. Um, certainly we will be plowing that and as part of uh, maintaining that during the winter, we'll also be, be plowing the uh, neighbor's spur, I imagine as well. So I'm not sure if I answered your so, question, but that's kind of where, where our take on the, the driveway condition is right now. You did, and I understand. But as I understand it now also, the current occupant only has one vehicle. What if you have occupants where there are now more vehicle than current parking spaces? What is the plan for that? Uh, I'm not um, actually not familiar with the street parking uh, there. I know there's oftentimes cars parked on Taylor Street. Um, and I don't know if that's a permit required. We haven't actually looked into uh, that. As of yet, we've been more focused on um, if it's even a uh, property that's going to work for us because of this permit issue. But happy to look into that further. Thank you, Mr. Wachilla. Yeah. Uh, so I was going to ask: Do you know if the parking area has adequate lighting at the moment? And whoever wants to answer that, please feel free to do so. Yeah, I haven't seen it at, in the evening. Um, and... So, but, but the plans don't show any lights. The site plan doesn't show any lighting. Uh, I'm looking at this. I don't know if you can see this. The that it's a submittal um, site plan. The date is the 2017. There's no identification of lights in the back. I don't know if there's one off the back of the house that attempts to light off the, uh, the parking area. You know, I, I, I'm just gonna, I think that this, I'm not opposed to the notion of, a, of fixing the problem with the use, that making it a, a non-owner occupied duplex. I mean, I think that's what it's been used as for years, even though through inadvertently, it was not permitted as such. And there are certainly other non owned there are other multifamily units on that house on that on that road and um i think it can be done um and, and not and still we can still meet our requirements under 10.38 to make sure that it's not bad for the neighborhood etc cetera, etc cetera, all the other things but i feel like we there's a lot of work that there's some work that has to be done to make us feel a little more comfortable with this application and you may be a little more comfortable with what your requirements are in this town and it doesn't have to take a lot of time especially for two professionals to sit down with the staff and say all right i need a lighting plan i need a management plan i need to abide by that i need to identify the rooms as how it's going to be used and, I have, and we have to tell you whether the upstairs bedroom is habitable or not and come back to us and say this and you can, i think it could be done fairly quickly I, I don't want to delay the sale is what i'm saying i don't want to delay the sale but i want to feel comfortable with what as chairman i want to feel comfortable with what I, we're permitting. And that's not coming from a place where I, I'm predisposed against it. I'm just at kind of up in the air as to how it's gonna be done, where the lighting is, what are you gonna do about parking? What do you tell your tenants? How many people are, are gonna be there? Um, how many people are, can be there for a party? That's another thing we always look at is how many, what's the total number of, of um, people that can be on the site at any one time, et cetera, et cetera. In a college town, that's something you care about because you don't want to have 50 person parties every weekend you want to have mm -hmm. you guys control that you know you tell us how many people and i just feel like you, you need a a little bit more to fill this in before we before i'm comfortable now maybe other board members are comfortable but that's my feeling right now and i bet that you could do it within a couple of within a short period of time get the information together and we could come back and, and uh, consider this thing fully mr meadows what do you think I saw your I'm, I, I'm in agreement with you. I'm uncomfortable in, in uh, having a motion on this tonight, given um, the roughness of the application. I think it needs to be polished exactly as you're suggesting uh, to include the architectural plans being um, legible, if not more finished and uh, 
and the planning department, I think, can be helpful in getting this done. Uh, but I, I don't think that it, it, that we can really uh, do anything with this application tonight. And I think when is the when is the transaction post supposed to take place? Um, it's contingent upon the the permit approval, so it, it's a it'll, be, it'll happen after the permit approval. And you yeah. have enough time. Your financing gives you enough time to or. You have a couple of weeks. You have some weeks. Okay. Yeah, it's it's, it's all. It will just set it a certain number of weeks after there is a uh, approval. All right. So let's do this. Let's, unless there's anybody that objects, let's have you work with the staff a little bit more and deal with some of these things directly, and then we can process it. Yes, Mr. Wachilla. I just want to say the next date available. That's relatively soon as October twenty eighth. That meeting. It's wide open. Uh, yeah. We don't have anything else that day, and that's a good date yeah. to move this forward to, and definitely give you guys enough time to work on it um, to get this thing moving forward for you. Because um, we we would hate to delay a real estate transaction. October twenty eighth is a Saturday. Oh, sorry, not twenty eighth. That um, thank you for catching me on that. The twenty sixth. My apologies. And so that, that is two weeks from today. Yeah. So let's. So that's working with the staff, the things you're going to need, you're going to need a lighting plan. Just, you know, it's not, I don't need a photometric plan, but I need mm -hmm. where the, what the lights are going to be. We need a, a good floor plan, identify the rooms. You're going to have to work with the current owner to, to look at the, um, the fourth floor, or let people come in and see it, you just, or else uh, don't apply for that to be a bedroom. I mean, make up your mind on what you want to do with, on the fourth, on the, the loft area. Um, the landscape plan, the make the, Management plan, it's all it's laid out in the rules as to what you need to have there, but snow removal, lawn, trash, go to the basics, right? Um, check on the parking. Right now you've only got three. We you know that's um, that's okay. Uh, we'd have to we we can we can permit permit that, but you know, um, you've got to deal with that. And then you've got to have a parking plan and how do you enforce it? You just it's real easy. Do you give them stickers or do you tow it away or what do you do? Just those are the kind of things the staff can work with you on that, but we'd like to see those things. So let's come back in um, the end of October and hopefully you'll have it done by then and we can reconsider it. Yes, um, Mr. Slogan, you had your, you were raising your hand. I am not available on October 26. Okay. I don't know if that's a factor, but I've been on the first part of the hearing, so I don't know yep. if that's helps or hurts. Now let's see. What do we have? I think we should also ask. Um, sure. Go ahead. I was I was going to say to the, I was going to say to the applicants. Um, is that sufficient time for you? I mean, that's only two weeks away. I believe so. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's the next meeting is November what, Rob? November ninth. November ninth. Mm-hmm. Are you available? Is everybody available November ninth? Yes. No. No. <laughs> no. I'm not I'm not available on the 26th either. So okay. All right, Mr. Henry. Um either one of those dates will work for me. Okay. So we can't do it on the 26th because we won't have we won't have enough people for a, a four-person vote. So we have to do it on the uh the ninth, the, the so ninth. Mr. Mr. Chair, what if we, um, since Thursdays might be constraining for some people, what if we did it like on a different day around the 26th or around the 9th? I don't know if that's doable. Um, just because, you know, we, we need four, we need all of you present in order to vote for this. All four of you. Because a special, a special permit requires a super majority vote, which is four out of the five members. Oh, we don't have Mr. Gilbert here. We don't mm -hmm. know what Mr. Gilbert's schedule is. Yeah, so I don't know if folks are busy on October 25th or October 27th, which is a Wednesday and a Friday, but you know, I'm, I'm available on the 25th and I'm willing to do it. And I am not here on the 27th. Okay. 25th. I can, you know, I, I can make the 25th work. It's inconvenient, but I can make the 25th work. I feel like we should give them more time than less. Yeah, time. I do too. 
even yeah, though I'm in I'm in Florida that week, uh, and I'm in the, in the week of the sixth of November. I'm in in meetings in in New Orleans. So the last thing you want to be, if you could be in New Orleans or on a Zoom for an Amherst special permit, I I'm thinking. <laughs> Particularly with business meetings. Yeah, I, I think you're gonna they're gonna be listening to jazz in New Orleans. That'll be all um, right. So, so we the, the difficulty is we have to set a date today, um, and then so maybe the best thing to so maybe the best thing to do is we don't know what Mitchell Gilbert's um, situation is and his availability. So maybe the best thing to do is to set a date quickly, and if it, and then if we, in the meantime, set a date we know we can't meet, because all we all can't be there. Say the twenty in two weeks, knowing that, but in that time, Rob will be able to go out to Mr. Gilbert, get his time. You'll be able to find a date, and we can set another date, continue it, and that at that meeting, so we can set a date for. November 9th or November 12th or something ever, we can figure out a date that we can do this for you. But um, otherwise, I don't know how we pick a date with four of us here and we don't, and we don't, there's not a date that we can have four people because we don't know what Mr. Gilbert's availability is. So Rob, what I'm thinking is we might do the, do it on the 20, within two weeks mm -hmm. and then continue it and use that meeting. We will, by that time, you'll be able to figure out everybody's calendar we set it and set another date then and then it'll be it'll be at least two weeks from that because we have to do public notice right or if three of you are present and mr gilbert can make it and he does the mullins rule he could you could still vote that day so what if, if can, how if do we do, do this that. we 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 set it for the 26 at six and i do a lot of background work to make it happen on my end uh to see what john gilbert's availability is and um just go from there unless rob mr. wants to add something can't. Mr. Sloter can't be here on the 26th, right? Right. Mr. Meadows, are you Mid available on the 26th? Mr. Meadows is not can't be here on the 26th. No. Right. Okay. So we know we, we only got three. So the only the value of the 26th is that we could set mm -hmm. another date at that meeting. Excuse me. The fo following through on Rob's suggestion, it sounded like the ninth that would work, that could potentially work. So if you continue to the ninth and you have everybody but Mr. Meadows, we might be able to then, do it. Then Mr. Gilbert might be able, or somebody else. I mean, it, mm -hmm. you know, we could find an, a, another alternate member that could uh, review the, the this tape and catch up oh, for that meeting. They, they don't have to be in the original panel. They have to watch the. Don't they have to watch? Well, we don't have any. The thing. Have, uh, Mr. Gilbert's not in this panel. That's right. true. He he was in the previous panel. The um, oh yeah, isn't he assigned to this panel as well? No, not no, not for this hearing. No, this case is perfect. Case, okay, case is perfect. Great. Yeah. Four of us. Got it. So, yeah. so anyway, it's like the ninth. the ninth that could potentially work, and if not, then then you can look for another date. But if we could get an alternate to to serve on the ninth, then we we can make it work. Okay, got it. I thought we had we'd only have the same panel going forward. Perfect. All right. So who can be here on the ninth? I can be. I can. I can be also. All right. We're hoping Mr. Gilbert can as well. All right. We'll miss you, or, Mr. Miles. Or an or an alternate, Mr. Gilbert. Or an alternate. Yeah. Or an alternate. Right. Right. Yep. It'll work. Okay. So we're going through. <laughs> it's a lot of machinations to make it work. What I want from you guys then is to work with the town and get more. Um, specificity and meet the what we need for the different requirements management plan lighting plan landscape what to do with snow all that kind of stuff all right lease number of t number of people and figure out what you want to do with the loft and, yes, and, and a good site plan all right mr wachilla so just to make it less confusing for the applicants um i'll send you a list of stuff tomorrow for you to to work on between now and the ninth, um, it'll be very detailed. I'm gonna look over the materials we do have and suggested changes, um, areas of improvement, stuff like that, just to make sure you guys can have a more complete application and one that's strong. And uh, yeah, we'll go from there. I mean, 
uh, I will also reach out to Mr. Gilbert. And if he's unavailable, Steve, I'll find alternate just so we have yeah. a full panel for that meeting because everybody has really busy schedules, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, that's that's all I had. Okay. All right. Let's be done with that. So I entertain a motion that we continue this. Oh, we, um, before we do, we have to find if there's any public comment on it. Yes. So... Is there, there's, there was a hand up, but the hand mm -hmm. is gone. I think the hand is back up. One hand up. <laughs> Yoga A, 1951. Are you there? You're muted. What's this? Did you hit it? Yeah. There we go. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, my name is Bob Tancredi, and I live at 57 High Street, yes. which is just, just across the street from the end of Taylor Street. I can look on my porch and look right up Taylor Street. Um, this is the first time I've ever uh, attended one of these. Uh, I have to say that um, I just want to make a comparison to what the first topic about having that solar array in the woods uh, to those of us that live around here, and and there are a lot of multi-unit uh, homes, houses, buildings around here, but the fa the majority of them are owner occupied. So when we're going to take one of these houses and we're going to change it to non-owner occupied, we all see visions of Main Street. And you know, down the end of High Street, what Main Street looks like heading out to Pelham, non-owner uh, occupied buildings. So all I'm hearing um, for you folks to make this decision is, you know, is the plan right? What's the, the loft like? What's the lighting like? What's the impact on the community, on the neighborhood? It's just like that solar array in the woods. You're changing the face, the feeling, uh, the feel of this neighborhood by taking owners out of the neighborhood. Now, I'm sorry that that woman has been renting that place as uh, non-owner occupied for a number of years because of some technicality. Tough. Ob that just points out why this shouldn't happen. Amherst doesn't know who's renting what to whom, what is owner occupied, what isn't. The, the town should be striving to have owner-occupied rental units. Then you save the neighborhoods. You get young families. The only way that my wife and I bought this house was from the rental income from the house in the back. That's how we paid the mortgage and we were able to live here. Don't you want those kind of people coming to this town? I keep hearing you want more kids for the schools. You want young families. And these owner-occupied homes are the, are the way to do it not just turning them into student housing. I just, I, this whole discussion, you might as well just can confirm it because you totally missed the mark on what me and my neighbors talk about regarding this thing. Very cold, very cold. Um, and I'm sure nobody's doing this thing in your neighborhood because it sounds like you haven't been through it. Um, you know, why isn't this happening to homes on Lincoln Street? I'll tell you because there aren't a lot of multi-family homes already there, but those homes are big enough to chop up into apartments, but they're too expensive for the investor. Unfortunately, we live in an area where the prices are down just enough so that they can be bought up by investors and be chopped up. You know, that's not fair. And we're the ones that have been paying taxes here for 30 years. Well, you know, running this whole town on its small tax base. And now this is what I get. I get, you know, I get all these beautiful homes turned into apartments, apartment complexes. We don't need apartments that badly in this town. I was told by one of the politicians that, that was, you know, for building all those buildings with all those apartments because they'd flood the market and rental prices would go down. Well, that never happened. Those apartments are wicked expensive. So the same person told me, well, now they want to try this. They want to try to turn as many homes <laughs> into rental places. So, okay, I know I'm way over my time. Um, that's what I have to say. Uh, 
I'll, I'll be back because I know you people will be back trying to convert these homes into rental, you know, buildings with no heart. And Amherst is just going to be like students and wealthy or whatever. Again, my name is Bob Tancredi at 57 High Street. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Tancredi, for your comments. Okay. Um, there's no other public comments. Nope. Um, we will, I would entertain a motion that we continue this special permit application to November 9th, was it? Yep. At 6 p.m. 2023. So, so moved. Second. Second. Any discussion? The vote occurs on the motion to continue this hearing, public hearing. Chair votes aye. Mr. Meadows? Aye. Mr. Henry? Aye. Mr. Slobiter? Aye. Mr. Gilbert is absent, uh, or he's not on this panel. Uh, the vote was four to nothing. The motion carries. So work with the town um, and um, um, we'll see you on the ninth. Very good. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, next order of business is public comment on any matter not before the board tonight. Nada. And lastly, um, up, the new business upcoming, and normally that's where we talk about the schedule. So we're um, Rob, what can you tell us about the schedule coming up? Sure. So um, next week, next Thursday, we have a uh, the first of several uh, 40B uh, permit hearings for Valley CDC's project, 20 to 40 Ball Lane. Um, three out of the four of you are actually panelists on that uh, specific hearing. And thank you so much for volunteering. Um, Mr. Slover, unfortunately, you weren't included in this one. But uh, oh. there'll be more hearings in the future, and we know you love your 40 Bs. Um, and then after that, the 28th is currently empty. We don't really have anything going on, so we anticipate that one being a uh, business meeting because we have a lot of agenda or a lot of minutes that have to be approved and a few uh, topics of discussion from recent permits that Mr. Mora, if you want to address that or give us some sort of, I guess, idea of what we might discuss on that date. Um, Feel free to speak now or forever hold your peace. Go ahead, Mr. Mora. Uh, I, I'll take that, Rob, as you're suggesting that we come back and talk more about the uh, duplex question. So that would be just yes. fine if we, we do that at that time. Okay. And then afterwards, um, November 2nd is a 40B hearing for the same project by CDC. And then the ninth um, is this hearing continued, but also we might have two more permits scheduled for that date as well. We have a lot of permits coming in. Uh, so November might be a busy month for the board. Uh, other than that, uh, not much else happening. Uh, we do have a set meeting date list for those 40B hearings that go from the first and third Thursday of every month between now and early January. Um, we don't anticipate that project going beyond five or six meetings unless there's some complications that arise that we're unaware of. But other than that, Mr. Chairman, that is the schedule for the next uh, few meetings. Okay. Mr. Slover. I have a question of Mr. Wachilla about November 9. So yep. that is a continuation of the Taylor Street meeting from tonight. Yes. Which I am sitting on. And mm -hmm. then you said there are a few more. Am I therefore, I'm only an alternate. Mm -hmm. So does that mean that Taylor Street comes up first? Mm -hmm. I sit on that and then my parole comes through and I get to leave. Unless or, we or, might need you. <laughs> <laughs> or are you asking me to sit that night? I have no, I have not been, if I was an actual, if I was a full member, I would just know I was on the panel, but yes. what, 
what is expected of me on the 11th, if you don't mind me asking? So on the 9th. Um, on the 9th, I'm sorry. Uh, no worries. So anticipate that if a meeting is continued or hearings continue to that date, you're going to be on the panel for that date anyways, for that hearing. It's usually right. assumed that anything new on that date, you'll be included on that panel as well. The panel will remain the same for that whole meeting. Um, if it was one of the situations where we would alternate subs two people out within the same meeting, that might make it kind of confusing and and um, chaotic. Okay. But right. but if you're telling me, Mr. Silver, if you don't want to be no no part no, of this new <laughs> I just want to know what's expected of me. Okay. Well, you know we're going to need at least one alternate for that meeting because Mr. Meadows can't be there. So we'll need at least okay. one alternate. And if yeah. we can impose upon you to um, no, I'm happy to there. do. I'm I'm happy to do it. I just don't, I haven't been asked. I have one other question. Who is Mr. Gilbert? <laughs> <laughs> he was at the last uh, Shoots Bay Road Solar hearing. That's that's yeah. Mr. Gilbert. He's um he's a full member. He's an architect. He works for um, Wayfinders, I believe. Oh. Uh, oh, he's okay. been on the board I, for... I thought, okay, I'm sorry. I Relatively thought, young guy. I thought yeah. Mr. White was the, Philip White was the other mm -hmm. full member. No, Phil, Mr. White is a full member. Yeah. Yep. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. He's not, he's not part of this uh, panel. No. He'll be at the 40B panels Okay. Um, coming no. up. I, I just hadn't heard the name. That's all. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. That means that we ought to have a get together, a Zoom get together so we all get to know each other. I think, Mr. Clover. That would make, that would make sense. There you are. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay, thank you all for your work tonight. Um, it's 8.52. I would entertain a mo motion to adjourn. So moved. <laughs> Second. Aye. All right. The motion is not debatable. The chair votes aye. Mr. Meadows. Aye. Mr. Henry. Vander votes aye. Mr. Sloviter. Aye. All right. And... We have one absent, so the vote is four zero one. The motion passes. Good night, everybody. Thanks for all your help. Thanks for all your work, and we'll see you again in the near future. A lot over the next couple of months. <laughs> Good night. Good night. Right, thank Good night. you. Good night. Good night, everybody. Good night.